Good morning, members, and welcome to this meeting of the Education and Learning Committee. Remote, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded and will be made available for viewing through the, our Council's website. Remote participants, please follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones and switching off your video when you're not addressing the meeting, writing speak in the Teams chat function when you want to contribute, and if you're in the hall, you can do this on your iPhone or iPad. Please don't repeat contributions already made by other members, and no material should be posted in the chat function if it is intended as part of the discussion. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. And if any member has to leave the meeting, please either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time or write leave in the Teams chat function, and then join when you rejoin the meeting so that we can keep track on whether the meeting is quarried. All members should speak clearly and directly into the microphone when making contributions, and when referring to reports, please provide reference to the relevant page and paragraph to allow everyone to follow. Please focus contributions on the areas where clarification is required or to propose an alternative to a recommendation. Now, we have several important reports to consider today, and I anticipate that we will deal with the business in our usual efficient manner. Tracy, can you provide the sedurant and any apologies, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Morning, members. We've got 25 members present in total, 12 present in person at Council HQ, being the Chair, the Vice Chair, Councillors Dougie Campbell, Councillor Dashper, Councillor Dorward, Councillor Jameson, Councillor Lowe, Councillor Scobie, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Stitt, and Councillor Wilson. And in present, we've also got uh, Julie Irvin present in the, in the hall. And we've got 13 members present on Microsoft Teams, being Councillor Davis, Councillor Dempster, Councillor Hill, Councillor Ingalls, Councillor Little, Councillor McGregor, Councillor McCammon and Councillor Young. Also present on Microsoft Teams is Stuart Clement, Mel McGill, Laura Moody, Anne Barber and Robert McQuiston. We've got four members not present at the start. That's Councillor Karen Crothers, Councillor Wood, Sam Scobie and uh, our Youth Council representative, Lydia Elizabeth Shaw, who should be joining us shortly. Apology from the other Youth Councillor, Thomas Payne. Um, a substitute should be attending for him um, later on, Chair. And, um, sorry, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I approve of members' remote participation. I also would like sorry, to just put yeah. in apologies from Councillor Wood. Thanks, Chair. I can see that Councillor Karen Crothers is now online, so I'll update my records. Thanks. Thank you. Now, before we start this morning's meeting, we have a presentation to be made um, to a group of pipers and drummers from the youth school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may say a few words, Chair and, and Vice Chair, before we invite our representatives here to be thanked formally by this committee. Last Sunday, the Vice Chair Councillor Johnson and I attended the Scottish Schools Pipe Band Championships. It was a day of competition and camaraderie and a showcase for Scotland's talented young musicians. So today I would firstly like on behalf of this committee to thank Mr Andrew McCartney and the South West of Scotland Piping and Drumming Academy for working with the young musicians from Dumfries and Galloway schools. Andrew has been working for many years to promote piping and drumming in Dumfries and Galloway and we have formed a band to enter this competition. It's clear the immense amount of work it takes to prepare pupils for such an event. The work of the South West of Scotland Piping and Drumming Academy isn't funded by our council, but it is closely supported by Melanie Henry and the Instrumental Music Service. It's clear that the young musicians had put in a huge amount of effort. The performance was accurate and polished, and enjoyment and pride in the performance shone through, along with the pride of their tutors, parents, and supporters. So a huge congratulations to Dumfries and Galloway Schools Pipe Band who became a remarkable second place in the junior section of the competition and this is a huge achievement. 
In addition to this, the Friesen Galloway Schools Pipe Band were the winners of the Ailey MacLeod Endeavour Award. Ailey MacLeod was a young piper from Skoll in Aklit in Barra for the pipe band, who, and Ailey tragically lost her life in the Manchester Arena terrorist attack in 2017. The award in her memory was presented to Dumfries and Galloway Schools Pipe Band for demonstrating perseverance and resilience, community contribution, enthusiasm and camaraderie, innovation and efforts to include everyone, regardless of circumstances, much of what Andy McCartney has stood for over many years. It's a great honour to bring the Ailey MacLeod Award to Dumfries and Galloway Schools. I wish the South West of Scotland Piping and Drumming Academy every success going forward, and again, on behalf of the service, I express the gratitude and congratulations of the Council for your support of our young musicians in the region. And if I could ask Andy, Mel, Ben and Eva as the representatives to come forward and to really be presented back with your own awards, but by way of thanks from this Council. Yes, Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. Can I just add that um, South West Scotland Piping and Drumming Academy rehearse on a Saturday at North West Community Campus, and there's an open invitation to any elected member to go along, and it's really insightful and useful to go along and speak to Andy about the hard work that he's done. And, and it's, actually really mo it's actually more insightful or as insightful and useful to talk to the parents that are there with their children, to see the benefits that, that, that gives for the children. Um, of, and, and young people um, of the region. It's fantastic. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Dorward. We will now continue do we, with item two. Do we have any declarations of interest? Thanks. Now I've got a statement of connection on item four. Um, my granddaughter attends Logburn Primary School. After, after taking advice, I shall remain in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Hi, Chair. Um, same agenda. I'm um, statement of connection. My daughter goes to Lorburn Primary, um, but I'll remain in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Well, we now move to item three, minutes of the previous meeting, 25th of January 2024. Can we approve the minutes of the meeting held on that date? Do we have approval? We will now move to item four, which is the Dumfries Learning Town, the future options for Lowerburn Primary School and Dumfries Academy. The report is by Director of Skills, Education and Learning, and we have Mo Agun and Laren Foss are here to assist if members have any questions. I will now open up the meeting to members' debate. Councillor Lowe. Not a question, but so much um, as, as a thank you. Um, I think it was my idea that we maybe we go to visit these buildings. Um, it was a really eye-opening visit on Friday, and I would like it noted thank to the staff and the janitors and the education officers for arranging that visit. It really shows the concerns we have about the lack of play space for that Lawburn Primary School and the buildings at the academy, so it will really help to inform this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lowe. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of questions. Um, why is it taking the Council six months to write a paper that is nothing more than a desktop exercise with no new information, no costings, no analysis, um, just vague options, none of which have been explored? Um, where's the urgency on this, given what we saw on Friday? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Agun, would you like to take that one? Thank you. Yeah. Uh 
Well, I would just like to, to assure uh, Councillor Stevenson that the, the process we were trying to go through here is to do uh, an appropriate option appraisal through the Treasury Greenbook to 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 visit the, the options, analyze them and give us a, a preferred uh, option. Uh, yeah, I take your comment about the length of time. Uh, we 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 are working with our colleagues and educations uh, to get this for the the big committee as as per the uh, the report. But unfortunately, but the, during the past few months, we encountered issues with drags, etc., which which kind of took quite a lot of our resources. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd also like to thank. Um, the Education Department for the visit to Dumfries Academy in Lawburn Primary. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend on Friday, but Laren kindly um, gave myself and Councillor Dorward a tour last Tuesday, so thanks for that, Laren. It was really helpful and insightful ahead of uh, this item today. Um, I just have a few questions on um, the options for Lawburn Primary, um, and I've got uh, several questions, so I'm just wondering if you want me to do them one at a time or if I just run through them quickly. Thank you. Can, can we do them one at a time so I can give you uh, an appropriate answer for each one so I don't miss anything? Yes, that would be fine, Mo. Thank you. Right. That's yeah. great. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at um, option one and I'm just um, I'm just wondering if you can confirm that the neighbouring building to the school, which is uh, the former art college, is now owned by building craftsmen who have a plan to develop into flats and do we actually think it's unacceptable to have a block of flats which effectively would be in the school playground if we want to rebuild on the existing site so that's my first question thank you thank you councillor uh, so the option appraisal itself uh, when it looks at any option we will assess the option and it will have a uh, Positive and negative outcome that they will will be part of the the, the evaluation, and uh, the point you raised in terms of flat uh, looking into a primary school will be part of 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 the consideration. Thank you. Did you have another question? Yeah, I've got. This? Sorry, I've got a few yes. here. Apologies. Uh, so, with regards to option two. Um, I suppose my question is, I'm not sure this even should be in the paper as an option, as um, I don't think it's, I don't think the building is actually suitable as it is, even if it was refurbished, if that's a fair comment. Yeah. Uh so uh, any option appraisal uh, as part of either the Treasury Green Book or the SCIM guideline, which is the Scottish Capital Invest Manual, uh, best practice is to consider all options. And even uh, some that we consider options that we do nothing, we leave the building as it is. But as I said, when we consider the options, each option will have as positive and, ne and, uh, and, and negative sides of it. And that, yes, what, what, uh, what you highlighted about the suitability of law, but as it is, will, will be taken into account. Do you have another question, Councillor Wilson? Or? Uh, yeah, just an option, right. <laughs> the option three. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you could confirm that the plan in option three would be re relocation of Lowburn to the Minerva Hall with both Lowburn and the Academy on a single site and not a split campus with the bridge. Um, and also, um, what, what other schools would be looked at for the review of other school sites? So it said, about putting it in with another school. So I'm just wondering what school that would be. Thank you. In, in terms of, of the Minerva and the, and the Academy, uh, during our uh, design analysis, we will we will see what can we fit the maximum within uh, the Academy campus. 
Uh, well, it's not especially when we take into account uh, the technical areas of the academy. Uh, but in terms of splitting the school or, or going to other other sites or other schools, uh, can I ask probably my colleague Lan uh, to, to pick that up for you? Does that help, Councillor Wilson? Sorry. Laren, would you like to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to, in, in terms of the, the schools that we would look to consider, the catchment area for Lobham Primary School touches eight other school boundary lines, so eight other catchment schools, um, and they're the ones that would be the long list to, to begin with. Some of them have very small points of contact on that catchment boundary. Some of the schools are not a size to be able to accommodate um, any increase because of the, the site constraints and the, the physical size of the buildings to begin with. So in, in real terms, and, and we'll obviously go through the options appraisal process, but in real terms, there are three schools that have potential capacity that is underutilised that would help in these situations. Those three schools, um, in, in, in no particular order, Locker Briggs Primary School <clears throat> has an element of capacity. However, I'm, I'm very minded that we're seeing a lot of development in the Heath Hall area, and we need to be mindful that there's a pressure in that side of Dumfries, um, so that might not be the best option, but again, that will be evaluated in this process. Um, one of the other schools is Lorraine Now Primary School. Its, its catchment touch point is very small, so in terms of what that catchment area would be redefined as, that, that would be very complex. Um, and the last one is Lincoln Primary School, where there's a, a level of capacity that we could um, maximise in there. There are a number of pupils that come from the Lincoln catchment area to Lorry now already. The river is in the way, there is a bridge. There's, so there's, there's, those are the schools really that would be um, narrowed down from the long list to, to the short list. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Wilson. That would be... Thank you, aye, that's me. Thank that's you. your big questions, thank you. Councillor Dempster. Morning, Chair, I thank you. My first question is, I understood that we were to receive a a report in May from senior officers that was supposed to set out the roadmap and, and examine the future provision or, or requirement. And, and that's, of course, being viewed by some folk with some degree of trepidation. And I find it odd that this report's coming in advance of that when it should really be part of that overall long-term view on how best we make provision for pupils in, in the free and in the wider region, of course. That's my first point. And the other point is, it says in 4.4.1, uh, the options not include do nothing and do not include closure. So if that's the case, I presume then that that is what we will, the position will take with any schools that fall into the same situation as the Free Academy, where they're either in a poor state or numbers are falling, or, or, or a combination of both. And the last point that I look at, I, I look for a, a kind of response on is that every option talks about undertaking backlog maintenance on a phased basis and reducing building footprint where possible at minimal cost. That would be a great approach to take for lots of small schools. They would probably benefit from that and allow them to function without this pressure of being scrutinised because of the, if you like, the vacant seats in a classroom rather than demand for the school in that particular area. So I know that's sort of reflecting on the wider report that might come to the next uh, education learning meeting. But I think this report should be tied to that because if we make a decision today, it's six months before we can visit it again, and it puts this particular school and them free suit of kilter with what that report's likely to say for the rest of the wider region. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dempster. Lauren, would you like to take that one? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Dempster. I think um, just in order of the, the questions asked, um, you're correct, there will be a, a paper brought to the May Committee that looks at the wider school estate through the school's modelling work that we're undertaking. Um, I think the, the challenge is, do, do we pause everything that we're doing at this point until that process has concluded? If we do, there would potentially be big gaps in um, what we're trying to address. I think the reality of the school modelling work is to define a sustainable school estate. 
Generally speaking, what we're seeing through the principles that were agreed previously are that size um, of schools is one key factor, as are the geographical areas, etc. But in terms of the schools that we're looking at today, their size and capacity are not something that would bring either of those schools under question from a sustainability perspective. Um, and, and I think we're in a position where we can take decisions on those schools ahead of what the school modelling process will define. Um, that, that, that roadmap, that journey, will absolutely have to look at how we move into that new method of investment and defining what the school estate looks like. And that will be a, 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 a gentle start to that process, looking at some of the challenges that we're facing, for example, on um, small numbers, etc. And, and that would be the route into it. However, those, those decisions are um, made time when we'll be bringing back the, op the, the wider options appraisals for, for these um, discussions today as well. So they tie back together into the same committee and that might be appropriate. Um, the second question on, on closure or um, the, the, the factors that have been ruled out of this options appraisal, these are, are based on previous engagement with stakeholders, whether that's through ourselves as a, as a council, through um, our staff employed at the schools, through the parents and through the pupils. So those, those, those reasons or those options have been discounted um, due to that process. With any school, irrelevant of where we are across the authority, that engagement process at a local level um, would take place. And when options for other schools comes up through the school's modelling, we would go into that micro detail to look at exactly what the, um, the considerations and what the options are that should come forward at that local level for those schools. So whilst the rules doubt in this instance, that might be the case for, for schools that are identified as less sustainable through the school's modelling. Um, the last question on backlog maintenance, I think that's a, a, absolutely a financial challenge for, for us as an authority. The, the number of schools that we have and the backlog maintenance level that's required is beyond the, the, the affordability that's in place just now. Um, and what we need to do is align that with the school's modelling to make sure that we do have a sustainable school estate, that we are investing in the right places for the right reasons, and it's having the biggest impact. Um, so this is all, all coming together into to one process that allows us to define what that sustainable model looks like and, and tie the investment that we have, not just through capital, but also through revenue, to make sure that the, the environments that we have for our youngsters to learn in is the best that we can possibly make it. Thank you, Laren. Does that help, Councillor Dempster? Not really, Chair, because we're still out of kilter, but I'm happy with the explanation Laran gave, and I'm happy to leave it at the moment. Thanks, uh, thanks, Laran, and, and thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Stitt. Thank you, Chair, and I'd just like to echo thank Laran and everybody for taking us around the two schools last week. It's the first <coughs> time I've ever burnt off 2,000 calories in one day, which I could do every day. But in a serious note, under option one, as part of the council proposal for a flood prevention scheme, Green Sands is designated for replacement car parking for all the spaces in the White Sands. Could you confirm that the entrance to this planned car park, with all the associated increase in vehicles, would be immediately next to the entrance to the school? Mo, would you like to take that one? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I probably won't have the best answer for you on that one. Can I? Uh, speak to some colleagues and come back to you with, with an answer about that particular project. That's fine, Mo. And my second point is regarding that centre, we were le led to believe yesterday when we got correspondence with Jamie Little, there's plan, a planning application imminent to go in for that. So I think when you look at options one and two, I don't think for any future appraisals that option one and two would be feasible. That's m what we think. Thank you. Councillor Jamieson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm going to repeat what everybody else said about the, the, the visit to the school. It was hugely informative. It was also really impressive to be led around by some of the senior pupils who were very, very impressive. Um, I'm going to touch on the wider learning estate that, that uh, was mentioned previously, that work's been ongoing for a while, and there's an immense amount of work in there, and it does look at the, the wider impact try and plan ahead. And it's a really good piece of work that needs real, really good 
uh, and sustained attention from members because there's a lot of work going into it. And sometimes we maybe don't put enough effort into understanding the pros and cons that are, that are put forward. Uh, as to the Fruits Academy and, and Lorburn, I'll, I'll take advice from people that are in, in the local area, but an, an a, a more general point is that this has been put off for ages for various reasons, including the leap fund, and, and I'm, I'm really disappointed, especially having seen this, the, this, the situation in the schools. It's a credit to the staff and the pupils how well they're accommodating that. But when you go into a primary school and you see children getting taught in lobbies that are needing assistive support needs and they've got ear defenders on, it's miles away from when we were at school, from all sat and desks. So these schools need urgent attention. And, and I think it's to credit to the officials that we're moving at a pace now. It's disappointing that LEAP didn't happen. And over the piece, I've, I've often mentioned the Plan B, um, which probably wasn't put forward as, as early as I can. And I understand that you didn't want to put work into something that might not be required. But what I would ask is that, yes, the plan's coming forward for the wider, forward thinking on the, on the learning estate, and it's really important, and, and there's big pressures on that. And I've often said we need to look at the macro, and then we deal with the micro after that, because there will be cases where there's a strong case for this or that. So let's not get blinded by these issues and miss out on the bigger situation that we need. We need better schools. The, 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 the budget will be stretched to the limit to provide the schools that the teachers and the children deserve. But what I would like to, to, to forcibly says we need to move on with these two schools because it's just not good enough. Um, and any member that took the opportunity, I'd like to thank the members that came along because it was a good turnout. The ones that weren't there, I hope they've got good reasons if they're on the education committee because it was so important to see on the ground what's happening, how the teachers adapt to situations that are not ideal and how the children adapt. I think it's really important that members actually take the time to see what things are. If we're making decisions, we need the knowledge. But my final point is, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. And I totally am in agreement with everything you said. And it was very enlightening and interesting to go around both those schools last week. So thank you. Lauren, would you like to add anything to that? Or quite good. Thank you. Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. I have two points to make, and if I can make the first one is in terms of 4.3.3, um, which are the options. Can you, as an education director, clarify that anything other than option 3.3i, sorry, option 3i, would require a statutory consultation. That's my first question. I'll wait for the answer before I ask my second question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Laren, can you take that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dorward. Um, what we have in place just now uh, through the statutory consultation process is permission to relocate Lobburn Primary into the Minerva building on Dumfries Academy site. Um, there would be the option to um, reverse that and they could remain where they, where they were without a revisit to the statutory consultation process. But anything beyond anything that meant moving Lobburn somewhere else other than those two options would require the statutory process to be followed. Thank you. Does that help, Councillor Dorward, or would you like to come back? It does help. Thank you, Chair. But I have another point to make, if that's OK. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. I'd like to move um, in terms of it's specifically looking at um, Lower Burn Primary School. Um, I'd like to, given the condition and suitability survey of schools, it does look like Lower Burn Primary School does need to move as quickly as possible from its current site. And I've heard colleagues, um, elected members, talking about how um, the state and condition of the school and its testament, again, if I can say to the staff, all staff, including support staff at that school, um, how well it's being run and how much um, people are actually devoted to teaching there and how much the pupils think of it as well. It's a fantastic school, but it, it, I don't think anybody would argue that it's not in the right place at the moment. And these arguments have been rehearsed by colleagues, so I'll not do that again. But in terms of um, the recommendations, I think it's a reasonable option. In terms of recommendation 2.2, I'd like to move that only options 3i, 3ii, I, and 4 are progressed um, in terms of uh, taking this report forward, and that four is amended 
in terms of relocation of Lowburn Primary to make sure it's a town centre location and setting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dorward. Do we have any further comments on that? Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Lowe is next. No, Thank no, you. No, no. Thank you. I've got a question. Um, Was he seconding? Councillor Lowe comes in. Councillor Lowe, can we just tell? Yes, Councillor I'm, I'm quite happy to second what the Thank proposal you. from Councillor Dorwood. Thank you. Cheers, Thank Cam. you. Councillor Lowe? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, both buildings are completely inaccessible and... I realised that, having had knee surgery recently, that it was actually quite a trauma getting around. Um, first thing is, does the Minerva building have a lift? And the second aspect that maybe we could consider, given the inaccessible ability of the main academy building, is would one option be for us to progress more quickly um, within the building, within the space? Um, doesn't particularly maybe affect the design to actually get a lift installed um, ahead of the main plan. Thanks. Um, just to say that the girls that showed us said they put that ramp in to make sure that a parent could get into the school and that a girl could only be educated on the ground floor. And I did, that's just not good enough. Thank you, Councillor Lo Mo, do you want to answer that one? Yes, in terms of me, uh, the, problem, the problem with the academy is the levels at each level. So each floor, for example, have various different levels. So the installing a lift early won't resolve the, the accessibility of the uh, of the building. Uh, the other question you ask about the Minerva, uh, the Minerva doesn't know doesn't have a lift. Thank you. Does that help? So I'm assuming that any plan to use Minerva would have to include a lift as part of the costs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dorwood, I'm going to propose to leave the recommendation as is. It's a motion. Yeah. Do we have any amendment? Yeah. Councillor Brody. Yeah, so I think uh, we've heard from officers say that uh, best practice is to, to examine all the options and the, at the next meeting will be the opportunity for those options which are not suitable to be discarded and would choose a favourable one. So I think we need to go with, go with, go with all the options. I have said, heard some parents say that, ref, that they, they, like the, they like the old building and that uh, it should be refurbished. So it's an op option which has been expressed with other options from parents. So I think we should go ahead with examining all the options. Yes, Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have listened to the debate, and I think it's, it's our right as a group to move a motion which needs to be considered. It's also been seconded, so it should go. If Councillor Brody, I totally respect your position, wants to amend that, you can do so as an amendment to the motion that I've already um, submitted. I, I don't think it's in your... Well, I don't know, and somebody from governance can tell me if it's in your um, power as Chair to deny a motion being put forward in the democratic process in this committee, Chair. Thank you. I'd like clarification on that. Thank you, Councillor Dorwood. Tracy, would you be? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, so a motion's on, on the table, proposed by Councillor Dorwood, seconded by Councillor Stitt. So, um, Chair, whether you would like to put forward an amendment that we leave recommendation 2.2 .2 as it stands? I would, like to put I would like to put forward an amendment, yes, that it stands. And um, is anyone seconding that? Councillor McGregor. Councillor McGregor. Chair, yeah, I'm very happy to second it. I, I think it's imperative that we have all options scoped for the next committee and, and have them all on the table with the fullest of information. I think discarding some options at this stage would be and definitely not best practice. The key thing is communities need to understand that 
we're, we're seriously committed to finding a solution for both these schools, the pupils and their staff. But I think to limit options at this stage um, would not be best practice. So I'm very happy to second the Thank Vice you. Chair. Thank you, Councillor McGregor. Councillor Dorwood, did you want to come back in? I did, Chair. Thank you. I have concerns that um, at some committees at the moment in this Council, the administration appears to be seeking to stifle the democratic process. And your comment as a chair saying that this will not, the motion that I suggested would not be taken forward is highly inappropriate. And I think we need to think about governance and how we chair meetings, chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dorward. Thanks, chair. So I've got a motion and an amendment. If you're happy, I'll just proceed to the, the vote. So for clarification, um, the motion is proposed by Councillor Dorward, seconded by Councillor Stitt, and that is to amend recommendation 2.2 to agree that only options 3i, 3ii and 4 as amended to being a town centre location are progressed for the detailed option appraisal. Is that correct? And the amendment proposed by the Chair, seconded by Councillor McGregor, and that's to proceed with all options as detailed in the recommendation in the report currently at 2.2. So I'll proceed to the vote. Chair. Amendment. Councillor Brodie. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Motion. Councillor Karen Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Dashborough. Motion. Councillor Davis. Amendment. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Dorward. Motion, please. Councillor Hill. Amendment, please. Councillor Ingalls. Amendment, please. Councillor Jameson. Motion. Councillor Little. Motion. Councillor Lowe. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Amendment, please. Councillor McCammon. Amendment. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Stevenson. Motion, please. Councillor Stitt. Motion. Councillor Wilson. Motion, please. Councillor Young. Motion. And our church rep, Anne Barber. Abstain. And Robert McQuiston. Robert McQuiston, are you able to unmute? My apologies, abstention. Thank you. So the motion is carried 11 votes to 9 with 2 abstentions, so the recommendation will be amended. Thank you. And as I said, the motion is carried and these recommendations will be amended. Thank you. Are there any further comments? Councillor Stevenson. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, we're, we're talking here about going back and visiting um, these options as if this is new, this is now 10 years old. My concern is we have a consultation agreement for moving Lorburn onto the Minerva site and uh, keeping the academy as one site. I feel that push it, we're just pushing this further and further down the line. You know, we've heard today of the, the school estate strategy, which will come forward um, at the next committee. This isn't part of it because this is now 10 years old. Um, so on that, um, on option three for the academy site, it states that the reduced building footprint is in line with the bid three funding. Um, but we know since that, uh, including the bridge, didn't have uh, the support that the education department thought that it might. Um, Will this option include considering plans that would enable the full campus to be retained on a single site if Lorburn was relocated there? And would we need a consultation if, say, the bridge was then included? 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Laren, would you like to take that? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I think the, the, the reference to, to the LEAP 3 bid and isn't so much around what that option details specifically. It was around the accommodation schedule to see these are the amount of spaces that we need to be able to deliver the curriculum offerings that we want to um, maintain. I, I, absolutely. However, the option could remain um, to scope that out with, with the bridge included in there. Uh, as you've highlighted, um, we, we know what that feedback has been, and we know that as it stands, we probably want to consider the alternatives to what that could look like. Um, I, I'm actually, at this stage, not sure whether that would require a statutory process to, to reuse the, the, the bridge as part of the academy. My, my gut feeling is it wouldn't, because we haven't closed relocated, moved the academy. We've extended its campus. However, we would speak to our legal department to, to get clarity on that for you. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Stevens, did you want to come back in? Yes, if you don't mind, I would um, like to move the 2.3, agree to receive a further detailed report at the May 2024 Education and Learning Committee, which as far as Oh, no, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, note the previous considerations of options and agree that option three for Dumfries Academy uh, with a single site rather than split campus is set out at paragraph 4.4 is progressed for detailed option appraisal. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. I'll second Councillor Stevens' motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul Garrett, would you like to come in? Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I appreciate that. that uh, I would have before the, the, the previous vote because it relates to, to the same point uh, in terms of, in relation to, to this item, the, the options that are, are being considered will have resource implications and the members do not have resource implications, detailed costs in front of them at this stage. Uh, I'm conscious that there will be a range of other factors, but in terms of the required resources, that will require referral to another committee. And I think that when the other committees are considering these issues, they, it's important that they have full details on the options. Uh, so I, I'm quite concerned about committing to any specific options at this stage in terms of this paper, because members have not yet had any information yet in relation to the potential resource implications, uh, the impact on other member priorities. And in line with best practice, it is important, as Mo said earlier on, that all options are considered. So I would be very concerned about uh, any move to commit to a particular option at this stage. And as I said, even if there is identification of a preferred option, the Education Committee does not have the resources to progress that at this stage, and that would require to go further forward to either the Finance Procurement and Transformation Committee or full council for consideration of those resources. And certainly my advice would be that when members are being asked to take those decisions in terms of resource allocations, it's important that they have full information on the options available rather than committing to one particular option at this stage. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Stitt, you wanted to speak. Thanks, Chair. It's just in options one and two about the academy. I notice in both one and two it says avoid decant facilities, but if the, with the kind of work that's got to be taking place, I think the academy will end up in the building site, and would there be any would the kids be able to be relocated within the academy premises? Because well, the work that's getting scheduled here, it's major work, and I'm kind of worried if the kids might have, end up being decanted. Thank you. Laren, would you like to take that? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the academy site has uh, is, is in the position where the capacity for the school is 1,120. There's 608 children there as of census last year. So there's the flexibility to ensure that we can move children around, retain them within the building, still deliver their educational requirements, and still give um, a, 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 an appropriate contractor space within the school to, to refurbish, to do the backlog maintenance. It will be challenging, um, but the, the detail will come through that process once we've, uh, if, if that option is taken, and then we're looking at how that can be phased across the school. It's not unusual, it's what we do in lots of our schools across Dumfries and Galloway, but absolutely what we would try and do, our utmost to do is minimise the disruption that, that that creates. 
Thank you, Laren. Councillor Jamieson. Yeah, I, I, I'd listened closely to what Paul said. An FBT committee will obviously have to oversee this, but our job as an education and learning committee is to try and get as quickly as possible we get schools that are fit for purpose for the children that go to the Fish Academy in Lorburn. We've had a long time on this with, between LEAP and now looking at this. Uh, the LEAP uh, funding uh, announcement came back in October, November. We've had time. So I, I would like the narrowest possible option with due respect to the, the, the requirement to make sure that we're not we're not missing anything that that, that 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 would obviously be in the in the frame, but I think we should have done enough work by now to give us an idea of the cost implications. But the first priority for me has to be getting it right, but secondly, doing it quickly, and surely we'll save time if we're looking at what would appear to be the best option given the circumstances we're in. We looked at these schools, and I think the people that are offering opinions should have been at the schools to see what was what's like on the ground. Um, anecdotal opinion from people is useful, but it's not definitive. So uh, we need to move as quickly as we can, but at the same time have due regard to the ifs and the buts. But I would like to narrow it down as, possible, as much as possible so that the, the officials can work out quickly and concentrate on something that's going to be fit for purpose and cost effective. Thank you, Councillor Jamieson, which I'm sure they're all doing. Does anyone want to comment on that, Laren? Thank you. Councillor Stitt, do we have a motion on the table then? Is it a competent motion? Mm -hmm. hmm? Sorry, thanks, sorry, Chair. Given the advice from, from Paul Garrett, um, Chair, it's your discretion whether you accept that as a competent motion or not. Thank you, Tracy. Well, having listened to what Paul Garrett has to say, I would feel it's not a competent motion at this point. Councillor Stevenson. So we have all agreed in our budgets, every single um, party on this council, that we will that we will already invest twenty four million pound um, into this into DLT, which was the move from Lorburn to Minerva, and the refurbishment of the academy. We're now going back and asking for further options that have already been discarded ten years ago. So. I, I would like an explanation why you don't feel that it's a competent motion. Thank you. Thank you, the councillor Stevenson. Paul, would you like to come in on that? Thank you. Sorry, that's for the chair. For the chair. Just, I'm just going on what I've been heard. Paul Garrett has been saying, due to the money that's involved and the costing, and that's not under our committee to make these decisions. That was my. We're not making decisions on costings because none have been brought to us at the, on the paper. Um, and if this committee feels that we need to change this, then we will take that to full council, but that's this committee's decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. I think this would have to come to full council. Councillor Jamieson. I may have read this wrong, but were we, was this agenda point not asking us to narrow down the options? Or why was it brought forward at all? We, did, we wouldn't need that if, if, if the officials were going to look at all the options, regardless of what we're seeing in here. Why is it on the agenda? If, if we're not allowed to say, we don't like that, we don't like that, but we do like that, we'd like you to go that way. So why is it on the agenda if we're not going to get an opinion on this? Thank you, Councillor Jamieson. Could I ask the director, please, as to why this has been put on the agenda in that case? Thank you. Um, Paul, would you like to speak first? Yes, I, I mean, I, I think in relation to, to Councillor Jameson's, que Jameson's query, the, the reason it's on the agenda is to provide members with, with updated information in terms of the progression of, of these projects uh, and to set out clearly the process in terms of how to bring forward detailed information on the options that are being considered to the, the next meeting of the, the Education Committee. Uh, I think uh, it is important to recognise that officers fully accept and, and agree with the need for urgency 
in relation to this and in terms of my comments earlier in terms of the importance of ass assessing each of the options reflected in the paper, that was not in any sense a view that we should be delaying things to allow that further work to be done in other options. I think that can be done uh, together in an aligned manner. And as I said earlier on, I think uh, it's important that members receive uh, and have available the best information possible to support the decision making. So, so my advice would be that it would be best practice to keep the options on the table for that further review at this stage, rather than committing to any particular options. And as I said, that we don't have information on costings at the minute reflected in this paper, and that's one of the things that I think is essential when the, the next paper comes forward. So, so really. George, that, that really is the, the reason why the, the paper's on the agenda, is to give members an update on the, the position, set out a clear process for taking this forward, rather than asking members to narrow it down at this stage. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Stevenson, does that help any? Uh, no, no, it doesn't help at all. Um, and then if that isn't a competent motion, then we've just voted on a motion that would then also not be competent. So I don't know what's going on in this committee, but it seems to be turning into a bit of a, a farce. If these papers were here to be noted, they should have been noted, but it's asking us to make an agreement. I, can, I, can we get governance advice on that, please? Thank you. Tracy, do you have any? Thanks, you. My advice, members can put forward a motion. That's obviously your democratic right, is to put forward a motion. It's just that there's advice that's been provided subsequent from, from Paul. So. I can take the vote forward if the chair deems that a competent motion, given the information that's came in from officers, um, and we can proceed from there. Laren, would you like to add anything to this? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the question, I think, and, and the, the logic behind it is to provide officers the opportunity to move through this at a pace, and there's a, a desire to narrow the options. In reality, the options available for the academy under number three for the ones, the option that would include the bridge, that's been worked up already. That was the leap three option, so that's there. There is no effort or work required to, to, to bring that back to committee. Our focus on option three will absolutely be looking at how that solution could be delivered on a single site. Um, so, so in reality, what we will be doing is exactly what's being asked. So, so that might be helpful in the decision making moving forward in relation to the motion. Thank you. Director, did you want to say something? Councillor Jamieson. Sorry, Sorry to labour on this, but, but, but I will, because it's just confusing me. On page 21, 4.3, identifying future options in Lorburn Primary School with A, B, C, D, E, 1 and 2, and then in 4.32, A, B, C and D, were deemed to be not viable as it was recommended that these should not be considered further. Options A to D were not supported by the parent council either. That, 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 that's options that are taken off the table before we've had a chance to view them and discuss them. But yet we're not allowed to actually recommend what we think should go forward. So there's, it just doesn't balance up to me. And I, when I read this, first of all, I was confused because with an A, B, C, D, E, and then we've got option one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's confusing, uh, and I'm not just being awkward here, but we need to get this right. And, and, I, and I do agree with, with, with Larn and, mm -hmm. and Paul that we need to look at all options, but it does look like options have been taken off the table before we got here. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it was influenced greatly by the parent council, which is right and proper, but not just the parent council. The parent council will represent a small portion of that school. And, when, and the council of members aren't getting a chance to, to, to discuss these options either. I don't disagree with these being out, but these have not been presented. And we've been presented with other options and we're not given an option whether to, whether to ask the officials to go further with it. So there's a wee bit of a, there's a lot of anomalies in there. Thank you. Uh, I know that Laren has some comment regarding the 2019, because clearly we've got our original consultation, and then subsequently we have brought the results from the original consultation back to the table today, given the time that has elapsed. And I know that Paul is also keen to give us further advice. This is a, a complex issue, and we want to ensure that 
we are correct in governance terms around the decisions we want to make. So, Laren and then Paul, if I may. Thank you, Director. And, and that's exactly what I was going to highlight. Those original options, the A down to E, were um, brought in front of Education Learning Committee back in 2019, and that's what formed the Leap 3 bid and the move for Lobon to go into the Minerva building. I think it's, it's, it's proper and right to, to bring back the options that we have today. There's been a passage of time. Um, we were in a different position, and the, the expectation, the hope to have funding support with, with those two bids not being successful, we, we're not knocked back on this, but we're in a position where we need to consider the options to make sure that we make the right choices moving forward. I, I completely accept that we, we have um, a number of options here that are from two different time zones, if you like. Um, however, the ones in the, in the table are the, 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 the um, options that we're debating and discussing today, and that's the focus. Thank you. Thank you, Laren. Councillor Dorr, would you had, did you want to speak again? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for allowing me back in. I'd just like to clarify that the motion to amend option 2.2 .2 still stands because that was voted on and was carried. And also just to comment on, just a comment on what's happened here, um, which is actually quite shocking. The Council are all 43 elected members and we are a decision-making body. We do receive very competent advice from extremely competent officers, so we're not pushing back on officers or their ability or anything like that. What we are pushing back on or what our group is pushing back on at the moment is process, where there seems to be an attempt by the chair to close down democratic debate. And it's like Groundhog Day, it's like going back to full council when my colleague, Councillor Dougie Campbell, raised an issue about mothballing schools. Democratic debate was stifled there as well. And that's becoming quite concerning Chair, and I think it should be again noted that we need to have the opportunity to fully debate and discuss. And if we feel something needs to be taken to a vote, I think we should be allowed to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dorward. Now, there appears to be a lot of uh, sort of confl conflicting opinions here on whether we take this forward. And I would put forward an amendment to keep options on the table as per report. I will, so we'll continue with the motion. Chair, you're now accepting the motion put forward by my colleague, Councillor Stevenson. Yes. Yes. We're going to accept the motion, as there seems to be conflicting opinions here. So I'm going to go ahead with the motion to keep options as an amendment, to keep options on the table as per the report. Thank you. Sorry, if I can maybe help. Thank you. Chair. So the, the motion that was proposed by Councillor Stevenson, was it Councillor Stitt who seconded it? Sorry, I've not got that Stitt. And that was to amend recommendation 2.3, sorry. And the amendment which is now being proposed by the Chair is to leave recommendation 2.3 as it stands in the report. And can I have a seconder for that, Councillor Brodie? Are you happy we proceed to the vote on that one, yes. Chair? So, for clarification, the motion is to amend recommendation 2.3 to read, note the previous considerations of options and agree that option 3 is for Dumfries Academy with a single site rather than a split campus as set out in paragraph 4.4 .4 is progressed for detailed option appraisal. And the amendment is to leave recommendation 2.3 as it reads in the report. Chair. Amendment. Councillor Brodie. Amendment. Councillor Ca Campbell. Motion. Councillor Karen Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Dashper. Motion. Councillor Davis. Amendment. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Dorward. Motion, please. Councillor Hill. <coughs> Excuse me, um, amendment, please. Councillor Ingalls. Amendment. Councillor Jameson. Motion. Councillor Little. Motion. Councillor Lee. Motion. Councillor McGregor. 
Amendment. Councillor McCarmon. Amendment. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Stevenson. Motion, please. Councillor Stitt. Motion. Councillor Wilson. Motion, please. Councillor Young. Motion. Anne Barber. Abstain. And Robert McQuiston. Abstention. Thank you. So the motion is carried 11 votes to 9 with 2 abstentions and recommendation 2.3 will be amended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further contributions or questions? Thank you. We'll now move to recommendations. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, yeah, sorry, just on the recommendations to change 2.4, agree to receive a further detailed report to the May 2024 Education and Learning Committee, which as far as practical includes costings and timescales to determine its preferred options uh, from the ones agreed today as outlined in section 4.5. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We will now move to recommendations. Members that are asked to. Yes, please. I will get Tracy to read. Thanks, Chair. So, members were asked to note the work undertaken to set out the future options for the delivery of the final elements of Dumfries Learning Town for Dumfries Academy and Lawburn Primary School, as set out in section four of the report. Recommendation 2.2 was amended as per the vote to agree options 3, 1, 3, 2 and 4 as amended to being a town centre location for Lawburn Primary School, a progress for detailed options appraisal and that this be provided on the basis for selection of preferred option for delivery. 2.3 as amended by the vote to note the previous considerations of options and agree that option three for Dumfries Academy with a single site rather than split campus as set out in paragraph 4.4 is progress for detailed option appraisal. And 2.4 as amended to read, agree to receive a further detailed report to the May 2024 Education and Learning Committee, which as far as practical includes costings and timescales to determine its preferred options as outlined in section 4.5. Thank you. Do we have agreement? Thank you. We'll now move to item five, delivery of curriculum transformation update in secondary schools, timetable structure and alignment report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. Alison Chambers and Jim Brown are here to assist if members have any questions. I will now open up the meeting to members debate. Councillor McGregor. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I have some reservations around this report. I, I understand there's been a lot of work gone into it over a period of months and years, um, but it, it's probably just to focus at this stage on um, consultation with parents around the reduction to a four and a half day week. I think that they were quite comprehensively consulted on the, 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 the rationalisation of the timetable, but not necessarily the reduction to four and a half day week. So some clarification around that, because it certainly set the hairs running in my inbox at the moment. Um, also, what impact will it have on non-teaching staff? There's quite a lot of focus in the paper on the reduction from 22 and a half to 21 hours per week, which I know is a Scottish Government target um, and, and I understand that, but if it's to be a Scottish Government target, it, sh it should be paid for by Scottish Government. It shouldn't be at the expense of education for our pupils in schools. Um, so, so that's another area that I have concern around, particularly with non-teaching staff who could lose half a day's pay um, if this is brought forward. And beyond that, I suppose we don't have enough context or detail in the paper around the impact on the school meal service, what that will mean in real terms, um, and the financial impact through transport. So I, I'm feeling a wee bit nervous about this one. I appreciate that other local authorities have moved to a four and a half day week um, over a number of years for varying different reasons. 
but I wouldn't like to think that we're doing this simply to try and, and, and reduce the 22 and a half to 21 hours per week. It has to be done for educational merit purposes, in my view. So, as I say, slight, a slight nervousness around it um, and some clarification around those points. I do wonder if we should be deferring the report until May just to get that additional information, because I think I would have liked to have seen some granular, granular feedback on what parents and families and carers thought around the proposals of the four and a half day week. Thank you, Councillor McGregor. Jim, would you like to take? Thanks very much, and thanks for the question, Councillor McGregor. Um, I think your overarching um, point was that you wanted to be clear that this was not being done in order to make a reduction in um, uh, teacher contact time. I can absolutely assure you of that. If we look back in terms of when the original um, uh, discussions were had around this, that predates any sense that there might have been a reduction from 22 and a half to 21 hours. Um, this is all uh, predicated on providing the best possible curriculum choice uh, for our young people, and that's that's where the conversation started. What has happened, and I absolutely acknowledge the points you've made. What's happened is we've we've through that process realised other potential benefits as well as some challenges. I accept the point you made about granular detail. That's always a um, a point when you write papers about how much detail do you put in there and how much do you keep back. The consultation that we did run with parents, carers, uh, staff, young people does have a, a, a level of that detail, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, uh, but just then going through your points one by one, councillor. Um, Non-teaching staff, the uh, non-teaching staff in the main, their working conditions are linked to young people being in school. So that would be the same as for teachers. There will be some non-teaching staff, for example, janitorial services, where that might be um, contingent on the decisions made about the use of the school facilities on that Friday afternoon, um, which is part of the response that all other authorities have had to make sure that young people have got a safe place to be and activities to, to be part of. So I think that, that hopefully addresses that point. Um, uh, in terms of the meals, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, you can see that we've identified that that needs to be looked at. We have a statutory obligation to deliver on free meals, and that would remain, obviously. I've worked in an authority where we have, where they had this. Um, it worked very well. There are different models about how those meals are delivered. In some cases, it's exactly in the same way as the other four days of the week. In other cases, it's um, uh, a curtailed sort of brunch which happened slightly earlier. But that would be, again, part of the discussions about what that might look like. But you're absolutely right to say we'd have to prioritise the fact that we must ensure that young people who have the right to free meals can get it, and all young people have the right to a hot meal um, as well. Um, in terms of transport, thank you for that as well. That is um, That will be contained within the further paper. Clearly, there will be considerations in relation to whether it was a secondary move or a secondary and primary move, that, that would have a huge impact on what those uh, financial implications might be. So I think that would be part of the further paper. In terms of maybe a bit of granular detail on consultation, Alison, are you happy to? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So part of the consultation process that was um, taken forward last year, uh, we asked if the family the question of if we were changing at different times, whether there would be um, different days at, days of the week would have different endings to the time of the, that day. The feedback we got back from that was that for 952 that um, answered the survey, there would be little or no impact, um, with 463 saying some impact, with 244 saying significant impact. So, And then, of course, the response that's set behind them. So the, there is evidence to suggest that the majority would say that there was little or no impact on the changing of the school days. Yes, Councillor McGregor, do you want to come back? Yeah, thank you. As I say, I have no issue with the rationalisation of the timetable. I think that that's absolutely what we should be doing, particularly from a digital learning perspective and, and course choice. Absolutely. I think the contention is coming from moving from a five-day week to a four-and-a-half-day week, and I don't think that was explicit in the consultation. So it, depending on how you word a consultation, we all know this, we've all filled them in, suggesting a slightly different start or end time in a school day is not the same as saying we're going to move your pupils to a four and a half day week, which is going to then present huge childcare and logistical challenges. So 
I, I'm very strongly of the view that we need to look at this and we need to look at it very seriously for all the right reasons, but I don't think we have enough information here today, and I, I suspect we haven't fully consulted. And actually, that consultation should come with preschool as well. It's not just those that are at school, it's those that will be going into school in the next few years. So I, I have huge reservations around how we've consulted on this, given the magnitude of what it's going to do. And I, I, I don't feel we should rush into it. Just my view. Thank you. Director, do you want to say something? If I may, thank you, Chair. And absolutely hear the, the concerns. And we won't, obviously, this is a, it is a change. It is a change that other authorities have made, and we know that we have to make change in Dumfries and Galloway too. We can't always do what we've always done. We, we need to modernise our services. However, I absolutely hear that we have more people to speak to. I do wonder, I know, Leader, you we talked around deferring the paper. I wondered if it would be suitable to continue with some of the discussion, and that would advise officers as to the areas in which members would like us to look in more detail and then bring a paper back to, to the May Committee. But if we could allow the conversation to continue, that would be helpful for officers. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dorward. Chair, I haven't indicated that I want to speak, but my colleague, my colleague Councillor Stevenson or colleague Councillor Wilson have both indicated that they wish to speak, but I haven't indicated, and usually I know in this instance I want to speak. Julie, would you like to come in now? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've actually got rather a long list of questions, so if you'll bear with me and let me go through them one at a time, be, if that's okay, just to let people keep track of questions. Can I just ask the director to come in here? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And I, I'm very aware, I'm delighted that you've got questions. I suppose I'm just picking up that this debate is specifically regarding secondary schools at this point, and I know that you are predominantly the primary and early years representative, and I know we have Mr Clements here also from a secondary school perspective, so I'm just making that distinction that clearly the primary school element of consultation has, has yet to be undertaken, and we absolutely acknowledge that, so thank you. Didn't mean to interrupt you, Julie. Okay, thank you. Um, my first question was to do with the other models. We've heard in the report, so this is on page 29 to 30, it's 3.41, uh, 3.4, sorry. The report mentions other models already in place in other areas of Scotland. And what I wanted to know is, is the proposed model for Dumfries and Galloway based on one of these models, which is already working well? Because I know there are areas where it has worked very well. So I just wondered if this proposed model is following on the tails of that. So that's my first question. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the thank you for the question. I would say that because we have had that consultation and we've had an asymmetric timetable working group as well, we have taken cognizance of all the models across uh, Scotland, but we have looked at what would best fit our young people in the and Galloway. Thank you. Is it okay to come in with my yes, question? Sorry. <laughs> So the second one is thinking about those models that you've taken cognizance of, um, how do they compare with our rurality issues? Because we are quite, quite often describe our authority as a bit of a piece of spaghetti because it stretches out so far. Um, so for example, at the moment, a learner in Castle Douglas High School might be traveling from the hills up at Curtisfairn, and that's about an hour's bus journey to get to school. So if we're extending the school day either side of that, have we taken things like that into consideration? Because we all know teenagers like their bed. <laughs> so starting earlier and finishing a bit later, plus that travel time, could be a bit more problematic than, say, if we're in Verclyde or one of these smaller authorities that have got a smaller geographical area. And I'm also thinking, obviously, this is secondary, but I'm thinking about what that then would transfer to look like for primary two. So thank you for your second question. So again, we, we've looked across the country and we have looked at Fife, which is um, much more comparable. We've also looked at the borders in terms of what they are currently doing, but it would be wrong not to look at the, the, the central belt in terms of North Lancashire as well as Edinburgh to see what they are doing. So yes, we have 
tried to do a like for like, but um, I've discovered there are not two authorities the same in the, uh, across the nation, uh, but we are trying to learn from their practice to ensure that when we put ours into um, to practice that we've learned from others' mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scobie. Sorry, I've got oh, your questions. Sorry, Julie. Can Sorry, I've got it? 10. If that... <laughs> I just want to be really thorough. <laughs> um, the report mentions the improved uptake of after-school clubs on a Friday. Um, so has this been shown in other authorities who do compare to us in rurality? Because obviously in the Central Belt, which is where I grew up, um, you're not terribly far from out-of-school um, venues. There's lots of resources available locally there. Dumfries and Galloway being so spread out, you're fine if you're in one of our bigger towns, but in our smaller areas, that could be more problematic. This is specifically primary school now. So I'm thinking primary schools here where we are spread quite thin on the ground, um, how we would manage to provide those after-school clubs in those little rural areas. Thanks, thanks, Julia. I mean, I, th I think that relates to what uh, Director said. We we will be looking specifically at primary and the the what you're saying are the specific points that relate to uh, were this to be implemented in primary settings. So I think that's probably for the next paper um, in terms of the detail you're after there. I'm okay to convince. Thank you. One more question, Julia, then we'll have to bring some other members in. Thank you. Okay. This is really a secondary-based question, and um, Stuart can back me up on this one if he wants. Mention is made this is, um, of the online courses being used across Scotland. So this is 4.5 on page 30. Um, but there's real concern about what that looks like in a classroom. So, for example, in Highlands and Islands, there is an agreement that ensures a GTCS registered teacher sits within classrooms so learners have a point of contact so that there is someone, if they need in-school study support, that they can go to. But I'm hearing from colleagues in our secondary schools that they are actually not class committed to teach specific courses online. They are not a part of them and they are still being approached by pupils who are taking these online courses um, because they haven't got enough support through doing the courses online. And there's a bit of de-skilling going on of our secondary colleagues in that there are staff available to teach advanced higher, there are staff available to teach different languages, and their subjects are being more and more moved online even though they are available in the school and could be teaching those subjects. I'm really concerned that we're de-skilling some of our secondary colleagues and we're actually limiting choice. I have secondary children myself and I know they would not want to do an online course over being with a teacher in school. And the consultation we got as parents and to the pupils as well did ask, would you rather have online learning or no learning. And the choice over that is, that of course, they would go for online because the choice was none. But actually what's happening in our schools is teachers think they have got a class in the year ahead and then are being told, no, we're doing that one online. We're going to move you somewhere else. So I would like some reassurance that we're not de-skilling our teachers, that we're not giving our learners a raw deal. Thank you, Julie. Just, just uh, yeah, there's a lot in that, Julie. Thanks for that. And you're absolutely um, hitting the nail on the head. It's these kind of things that are front and centre of of our thoughts in terms of the. What I started off the answer to Councillor McGregor with, the whole pre premise for this is to make the experience and the range of subjects and the outcomes better for our young people. And so that idea of that you know, that it would reduce the range of options. That's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. And I think it is fair to say that by, for example, using the the existing advanced higher hub that has significantly increased options, you, you have a point to say it might well have been possible to have offered something in a given school, but there's always the local timetabling realities that mean that head teachers have to make those decisions about what can go forward and what can't. So actually by doing, for example, the advanced higher hub, we were able to offer 
the fullest range of subjects to young people in all all of, as you describe it, the, the pieces of Yeti. So there is that equity argument as well, that this is intended not just to give a much wider variety of subject choice, but an equitable subject choice. Um, in terms of success, we know from having done this for a, a number of years now, that those outcomes have been extremely good. So we have got good evidence that online learning, as has been done to date, um, has delivered very strong uh, outcomes for young people. But there's a lot else in which you say that you say there, which I think we do need to look into in terms of how we actually do this uh, on the ground if it were to be extended. So I take your point. Thanks. Thank you. Can I just come back in there? Yes. With yeah, what you're saying about the the courses and the accessibility, we're maybe giving more choices and more courses but what's the risk of quality and teacher de-skilling? So if you have a member of staff in your school who had a viable class, why is the viable class not running as well as offering online elsewhere? As in, if we've got the online offer, surely that could go into those schools where there isn't a teacher available, as opposed to taking pupils from a teacher who is available and there was a viable class. Thank you. Alison, do you want to take So in terms of your question, we devolve the organisation of timetable into our schools. And so therefore, the offer and the choices that are made is, is with the schools. What the digital offer allows is for that opportunity for young people that can't get it within their own schools within a viable class. But equally, we're also looking forward in terms of what are our options in terms of digital and what that would look like across our authority. And that's part of the work that's ongoing. So about the de-skilling of our staff, it's really about saying if you have a class of three or four young people, would it not be a better opportunity to then teach those young people in your class as well as offering out to other schools? So it should be actually expanding the opportunity where perhaps you had one or two young people in a class doing advanced higher chemistry. Instead of just delivering to two people, is there an option there to deliver that to other schools that perhaps don't have that opportunity? Thank you, Alison. Did you want to come back in at all, Julie? No. Thank you. Councillor Scobie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think Councillor McGregor referred to that she has, uh, feels nervous about this report. I'm seriously concerned about just slightly more than just being nervous. At making, you know, and my question that I noted here was who was consulted uh, or who will be consulted. I look at 4.7. And I can recall uh, from June 2023, and I attended one of these consultation uh, sessions in the Douglas York, but it was primarily uh, head teachers and parent council reps. But I didn't see any you know, indication of the mass of parents. And if we're going to get it right for every child, I think we should be getting it right for every parent uh, when we're looking at this as well. Uh, and, and Julie's referred to the primaries, and I was at a parent council meeting just this week uh, when uh, I asked the, the parents there if they knew anything about you know, perhaps changing in primaries. And I know the, the director has said that's still uh, on the cards or, or to come, but we've got to get it right in terms of the consultation. We should be consulting with parents. And again, uh, my question, who, who was consulted? Because I can remember uh, when we had reports before us uh, going back uh, a few years, there was always a part about the trade union, what the, the comments from the trade unions were to any paper. In this one, uh, you know, and indeed our way of reporting has changed, but there's no reference. And I had a telephone call this morning, and I believe there's been letters sent to, to members. The trade unions are concerned as to the changes in secondary in terms of the non-teaching staff and the implications of all that. Uh, again, uh, Gail has referred to it, but you know we should be consulting w w w with the trade unions uh, and, and anyone else who will be affected. And that's why I'm seriously concerned about any change that we have consulted as widely perhaps as we, uh, not perhaps, as widely as we should have. 
because you know in Appendix One, prescribing the minimum annual number of learning hours, consultation, and there's a, 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 an openness here that if people are only concerned, they can uh, complain to the to the government. Have I got the reading wrong on that one? When I look at page 50, responding uh, to this consultation, and again uh, on uh, in page 49 and 50, Scottish government con consultation process. I'm sure I'll be corrected, you know, on this point. But even being corrected, it's getting it right for every parent, rather than guffy. You know, it, it, it's guffep, uh, if there's a, a pronunciation for that one. But you know, I have serious concerns about the, the level of consultation to get to where we are at just now. Maybe not, uh, notwithstanding the, the, the motives behind it but that we do go to all the, the, the places where we, we should be consulted, uh, and head of that are parents. Trade you. If, I, if I may respond, and I think in acknowledgement of Councillor McGregor's point, we, it's useful to hear the views of members, and I think we are, you know, we, the, the request was made to defer the paper, but we discussed allowing the conversation to continue so that we can take guidance from you. Certainly, the, my understanding is that there have been LNC, there have been teaching representatives as part of the work throughout, and that we have consulted in some part with our non-teaching trade unions, but absolutely accept that we need to do more. And that's why we are looking to have this broader discussion today and then potentially bring a, a further paper back. I am conscious that this, isn't, this paper today is not around minimum learning hours because that is absolutely clear from the government. So we, we put this in as an appendix and I do recognise it's confusing, but it's absolutely clear, as Alison said from the beginning, this is not about reduction in teaching time. It's about the shape of the school week. This paper is not about digital learning. It is not about teachers de-skilling. It is not about minimum class sizes. It is not around secondary subject choice. This paper today is around whether we move forward on a change to the school week. And I think the general view is that members don't have sufficient information around that, and your conversation is helpful in, in guiding us as to what more we need to do. Yeah, Chair, just to the, uh, the point that, that the director's made, Gillian's made there in terms of, uh, and I recognise there has been a, uh, a teacher rep or, or a trade union rep in the working group, but uh, and uh, Gillian went on to say she had consulted with non-teaching uh, trade unions. I'm not in the position to say who is right and who's wrong, but the co telephone conversation I had this morning was that the non-teaching uh, trade unions had not been consulted. So I'm not in the position. So to, 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 to clarify and, and put that right, then we need to be consulting with the, the non-teaching trade union uh, organisations just to hear their views, and it should be, in my opinion, included in the report just so that we get their views and we know then that they have been consulted. Thank you, Councillor Denster. That's, yeah, a councillor. Councillor Scowby, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> councillor Jamieson. Yeah, thanks. And I've, I've listened with interest uh, to all the, the, the discussion. And we were prepared to put amendment for that it should be delayed for further consultation. Uh, it's obvious that a lot of people don't understand the concept and the implications, and it's mentioned in the paper as well that uh, we need to look at adequate insurance for implication and, and impl implication and risk. So it, I think we're all agreed that, that that's a requirement. I, I would, I, I want to dwell on the positives here. Uh, I've been involved with the the, 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 the notion of aligned timetables. Anti-symmetric working weeks in a previous employment when I was when I was promoting what they call rural skills, uh, and it was incredibly helpful to work with the schools that had anti-symmetric working week. And Borders was a good example because the the growing rural talent that was involved with was piloted in the face in Galloway and the Borders, and the, the application in the Borders and the the integration with not just the the, the rural college the SEC but also other colleges. It was fantastic. It was so easy to implement our policies, which required a child, a fifth-year student, to be out of school for a day or two half days. In the borders, it was easy. And here's, it was up to the 
and we were successful, but it was up to the it was up to the ability of the school to accommodate it. So there is so many pluses, but there's a lot of minuses as well that we need to find solutions for. This, the same as the learning estate. This is another change. It's transformational. And it annoys me, apologies, but it does annoy me that we, we, we always look at the hurdles rather than the end outcome, the objective. If we keep our eye on the objective, the hurdles are a lot smaller. Now, that's notwithstanding the fact that we do have to engage with parents that don't regularly engage, because I've had the same comments sitting having a coffee in my favourite cafe the other day. I got, I hear you letting the kids out at half past one. So I had to sit down and talk it through with her. So we have a job to do. You have a job to do. Because I know the great efforts you made to consult. But Willie Scope is right, and so is Gail, that the ordinary parent, if I can use that word, sends the kids to school, picks them up and comes home. So they don't get it. So we have to explain it to them. But I'm going to be a wee bit biased here as well. But we need to understand that we're asking questions, and the information is in there. There was three papers over the last three committee meetings, and they're quite voluminous, but read them, because we're asking questions, and I'm, Gail's nodding, but Gail asked a question in about 21 hours. It's nothing to do with that. So don't, don't confuse the politics with what we're trying to do in Dumfries and Galloway. It's another argument, the 21 hours. This is about equitable timetables for all the children in Dumfries and Galloway. I, I take Julie's point as well, but it's about upskilling teachers. And I've been in the borders and I've been in the highlands. They work with that. And there is a danger of digital creep, where head teachers and co will take advantage of computers and do it online. But if you do it properly, they've done a lot of it in the northwest of Scotland, where they've got islands and all sorts of stuff. So we need to be comfortable with the fact that it's not an excuse just to get the, the tablets out. Um, at Falkirk High School and McLaren High School, every kid's got a gadget. Every child has got a laptop or a notepad. And the teachers go in and they get it up and they teach. And they're taught how to teach. But the principal quo is we don't rely on that. They have to balance teacher facing. So if a, a child in Stranraer is getting online, then at some point in time he gets face to face. So these are all the things we need to iron out. But please read the papers analyze the stuff and ask them before we come to a committee because it's too easy just to have a pop here and there. So the SNP group have got grave concerns about the potential risks, further consultation. So my group are, they, they know I'm a, I'm a pro asymmetric working week, so I've got to speak for my group and they've got serious concerns as everybody else has about further consultation. But please look at the outcomes. This is good for Dumfries and Galloway because every child got an equitable course structure. Everybody gets the same options. And if you're in a school and you want to do go, go to the tech college or the barony for a day, it can be done. So that, that, that I, I would propose that we do, we don't approve this as, as in the recommendations that we have a further report coming forward and we'll, we ensure there's engagement with the unions. I've had the same conversation with Unison as well. And there is concerns. And, the school week is not shortened. It's the same hours. So everybody will be accommodated, but they need to have the confidence because it's scary for somebody that's on £12 an hour and they think I'm going to lose hours. So we really need to sell it better, if you like, and, and be open and honest that it's not all good. There is problems that we'll have to overcome, chief of which is probably transport. So there's a cost implication, but we have to go through all these things to get where we want to be. So I would, I would, I think we're all in agreement that we need to reserve this till till the next uh, meeting, and try and get some assurances that consultation has been broadened, and we take the time to understand what an asymmetric working week is. What what is teaching hours? What are learning hours? Does anybody in the committee know? Because that matters. Uh, so I, I would say we just need to grip, crib up a bit on this, and have a more informed discussion. But, but importantly, and everybody's in this, we need to consult with the people that don't necessarily come forward. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. Jim, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, I'm delighted to hear all the comments made. I think that's exactly the, the point that Gillian made. Keep the item open. Let's hear here in, in the chamber 
the concerns you have, you've been uh, made aware of, um, and very, very pleased to act on what you've said today. Thank you for the richness of the conversation, and we'll bring further papers following, uh, I don't know whether that will be following the full consultation, but we've certainly got an opportunity in May, and then we were going to bring a paper back in August, I believe. So we'll certainly be back here with the detail you've requested. Many thanks. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, did you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, strange as it sounds, I absolutely concur with the council leader, although I do find it a bit astonishing that she's asking for a paper brought forward by her administration to be deferred. Um, as a parent of secondary, primary and preschool children, I don't feel as a parent I was consulted, and I'm not one of those parents that just drops their children off at nine and picks them up at three. I'm really quite heavily involved in the parent councils at both schools that my children attend. Um, a lot of the points I was going to raise have actually already been raised, so I, but I just have a question regarding the recommendation 2.2 about aligning the primary school working week. And I'd just like to ask what consultation will be done with regards to this. Um, probably like all other members have been contacted by numerous parents with concerns um, if, a, if a school day on a Friday was to be shortened in primary schools mainly with concerns regarding childcare. And um, at the second paragraph on page 30, um, it says about activities on a Friday afternoon, um, which sounds great, but I'm just wondering how these would work and who would be responsible for running these kind of groups and how that would work with children who travel in school transport. Thank you. Thank you, um, councillors. Alison, would you like to take that? Yes, it's, uh, thank you, councillor. So in terms of how it would work going forward, we would have another uh, consultation, so we have a consultation Monday to find out the views. And also, just taking on the, the read of the room, uh, we'll have learned from our previous consultation to ensure that, that consultation is as wide as it possibly can be to get the, that detail that you're, you're currently um, seeking. And then in terms of the second part of your question, um, what will those activities look like? So again, looking at other authorities, they are a mixture. They're a mixture of clubs that are provided by school staff in some occasions, where perhaps that club would run after school. They're now moving that to a Friday afternoon. There's also partnership clubs in terms of karate clubs and such um, that are coming in to use the school facilities. As well as that, there's also, if we look at the secondary side of it, there's things like um, mindset and yoga as well as additional support for examination purposes. So there seems to be a breadth of opportunity from school staff, non-school staff, local communities, as well as partnership working. Thank you. Does that help, Councillor? Thank you. Councillor Hill. Hi, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think a lot of my points have been raised. Um, I had numerous questions. Um, like Julie, and whilst I fully understand that we need to align the timetable of Custom Fleece in Galloway, I really don't understand why that can't be done and why it hasn't already been done so that curriculum subjects can be offered better. Um, I don't agree with the asymmetric timetable, and when we look back to previous reports, we had four timetables in front of us, and B1 was the suggested one, um, whereas it had more negatives than it did positives, whereas Model C had the most advantages for children, staff, for everybody, and yet only four. And it was the same time scale that we have now, which was the five-day week at the same times. Um, I also think that the impact on teachers and non-teaching staff of extra time on a school day, ha has that been measured? That's my question, one of the questions. Um, will this longer school day reduce, reduce the time for after-school extracurriculum activities? Will teaching and support staff and families have childcare arrangements, particularly over in the West, where childcare is law non-existent? We already struggle to recruit and retain staff, and will this add to the issue? If they don't have the childcare facilities in place to stay either longer on at the school or the Friday, um, or oh, I could go on because this paper was really worrying to me, like it is to all my other colleagues in the chambers, as I've heard. Um, have we consulted with the wider community, with employers? Are employers going to turn around and say, oh, yes, because the council's changed the school week, we'll change the working hours? So 
you know, when I look at closing the poverty gap, I actually feel, are we going to increase the poverty gap for parents that work, who will then struggle to work, who don't have childcare on a Friday afternoon? During COVID, we talked about our most vulnerable children during holiday periods as well, needing to be in schools so that they were safe. And, you know, the free from abuse and neglect following GERFEC, we're giving them a Friday afternoon back possibly to go to those homes. And um, the impact on the catering services, have we measured the impact of, you know, what that will cost? I know we'll still provide a meal on a Friday with a new timetable in secondary schools, but we won't provide a break. Some children might have an hour journey to school, which has been highlighted by Julie previously. If they're travelling an hour to school and then they're not having a break and they're having to wait, what if they arrive at school and they haven't had anything to eat for breakfast and they rely on that break time to get something? These are all huge questions. The consultation, I as a parent, see the consultations, do the consultations, but don't feel that this is being consulted on as well as it could have been. Um, so for me, I think that this paper needs to come back and not to the next committee because I don't feel that's a, longer a long enough time for a proper consultation to be done. I look at the geographical area that we live in. We don't have the infrastructure on the travel. I speak to ex-colleagues in education and going on a primary school that my daughter did go to. The extracurricular activities after school didn't happen because it's at the choice of teaching staff. So if we're making the day longer for them and then expecting them to stay on a Friday afternoon, if they have children themselves, how is that going to be possible? Who's going to pick up the cost of these extra activities? And like Councillor Wilson said, how are children then going to be able to get home? You know, I know we have free bus travel because that will come back to me. But young children sometimes can't access this bus travel and they don't want to on their own on a public bus. So I think there's far too many questions around this paper and far too many things that haven't been dug into. I do understand that a lot of work has been done and I appreciate that, but I don't think that we're ready to make a decision on this today. So I'm with everybody else that's spoken so far and I, you know, I'd like to move this paper to be deferred, please. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thanks for those comments. Um, I think which is obviously in line with what other uh, elected members have said. Um, there's a lot of detail in there, so I'm grateful for Councillor Hill. Um, uh, absolutely will bring the consultation mandate forward to the May committee. And as you say, that will not obviously have been done by then. So uh, I think in line with what you said, Councillor Hill, the response that will be brought back to a subsequent committee after that. I think one, one interesting point you, you raised there in amongst a, a lot of detail was the retention recruitment element of it. And it is interesting to think that actually um, that is one point that is a vulnerability potentially if we uh, don't do something like this. Uh, it is fairly clear that many um, parents, many teachers, many non-teaching staff um, see a four and a half day week as a preferable option. Uh, and so it's a distinct possibility that actually we would end up being a local authority surrounded by um, other authorities which have conditions that staff see as preferable. So some of these points you made absolutely right and we need to do a better job, get a better consultation response to you um, and we'll seek that uh, mandate in, um, or we'll put the mandate in front of you rather in May. But I think it is as you've described, as everyone described, this is a complex picture. It is perhaps the fact that we haven't given enough clarity that has um, caused a, a significant level of concern. So I will certainly be back in, in May with the mandate and subsequent to that with the response to the mandate. Many thanks. Thank you. Does that help Councillor Hill for the moment? Yeah, can I just come back in on that? Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit unsure as to the answer um, that I received on that because I feel that myself as a single parent and knowing a lot of parents that work and struggle for childcare, um, you know, teachers, teaching and uh, non-teaching staff, caterers, um, anybody that's employed would struggle for childcare across our geographical area, particularly over in the West. Um, so, I mean, that is a valid point that needs to be looked at. But I also worry what we're teaching our children because how many jobs now do a four and a half day week? We already, you know, 
we need to teach our kids what the world what the world of work is like and in this paper it states that we went out and we spoke to children and of course a child at a secondary school is going to say yeah I'd like four and a half days to go to school or four days to go to school because a lot of children going to school they don't like it you know it, it's just the way children children are and um, so they're going to say that but we need to teach them that working is full-time you know they need routine and they need structure and I, and I just can't understand how this four and a half day week will work um, and like I say for me I think it will widen the poverty gap um, rather than reducing it with people that want to work so but thanks for coming back to me Jim and I look forward to seeing the consultation process and um, it would be quite good if possible I think what you're saying is you're going to bring the format back to us to have a look at before it goes out to consultation. Is is that what I'm guessing, or is it just going to come back before it's fully consultated on? If I could just have clarity on that, please. Thank you, Councillor Hill, Director. Thank you, and I think that was my my question back to committee, in that we had suggested a, a conversation around deferring of the paper. We've heard from Chief Education Officer that he will aim to bring a consultation mandate back to this committee. But, and there is also a request, or I'm sensing that there is a mood around not progressing this at all. So I, I am, I'm, so I, I'm just for absolute clarity, we're looking to bring a consultation mandate back to this committee in May. It will not have the detailed answers to many of the questions that are being raised today. It will simply be a consultation mandate which will include the questions that will be asked and who we will ask. Is that, would, would that meet the committee's expectations? Councillor Hill, do you want to come back in? Yeah, no, I, th I just think that that's the best option. I mean, there is lots of other questions. Um, so whether they can be taken offline and sent in uh, as part of the process, because I, I just feel um, that this needs a lot more work. And, you know, going forward, I think we've got a working week in schools. It doesn't seem broken. We just need to align the timetables. We don't need to change it. Um, but that's that's what I'm hearing from my constituents. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so, just for a bit of clarity, uh, especially considering some of the conversation that we've not long had, um, when I was looking into this paper and went through the, the back papers to this, um, on the 30th of November, from Agenda Item 12, that discussed this, uh, at 2.3, we were asked to agree to receive a report to the March Committee to note further progress of the Timetable Alignment Working Group. This paper that's now been brought in March uh, has asked members to agree the implementation. I don't understand why that decision, who made that decision and why it was decided that it would change from noting to agreeing. You know, this is, in a, as we've just had in the last agenda item, these, these things matter when they come here, we're making decisions. Um, if I could just get some clarity on who made that decision and why. Thank you. Thank you. Alison? Thank you for that. So once we had we taken the paper to yourselves in November, it then went back to the working group. And so therefore, the working group, including our trade union reps from teachers, uh, agreed that the best model to move forward with was that model. So therefore, to come back with anything other than this is what they have agreed from their collective points of view from all 16 secondary schools, that's why it came back as to agree the model. Thank you. Stuart Walker, Youth Representative. Hello, I'm Stuart Walker. I am the representative for the Stuartry and filling in for Thomas Payne, who unfortunately was not allowed to, was not able to be here for the meeting. I'd noticed that a lot of the um, the councillors had mentioned they had not noticed any um, consultation of both the youth as well as wider questioning of the constituents of Dumfries and Galloway about the four and a half day week change. I'm unsure of whether this was already mentioned because I'm not the usual representative for the education committee. However, 
we did recently put out a survey for the youth so we could accurately represent their views on the four and a half day week. This got 674 responses. Um, of that, about 71% did say that they had not already been had not already been asked, but 72% of them were in support. And in specifics there, that was not just the expected one of students saying things like they didn't enjoy school, but it is often put the, in reference to one of them. They had never noticed that they were able to have a select period of time to go over their hobbies, to go over any outside learning courses um, like open university and things like that. It's not accessible within normal hours outside of school and it's not able for them to upskill themselves and to gain these extra trades. And generally speaking, with a half Friday, it would allow a lot more regular time and more convenient time for them to both have any appointments as well as extracurricular learning opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for your input. Would, Alison, would you like to answer? No, thank you very much for that input. And I think you're absolutely right. The four and a half day week is not about reducing the amount of contact time you have with uh, in front of teachers. It's about opening up the opportunity to say, what else can we be doing? We recognise that academic achievement is not the only thing that school is for, that it's for much more, for, more than that, it's much wider. And so therefore that four and a half day uh, week would give you that opportunity to do other things. So thank you for conducting that consultation. I know that you did that a very quick turnaround. I know that the team were just appointed on Saturday. So thank you for that and thank you for your input. And I'd also say I would welcome your input as we move forward with further consultation. Thank you. Councillor Dashbar. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, I welcome the uh, Youth Council um, information there. If we could get that into the next report collected, that would be really productive. Thank you. Um, I would echo Councillor Jameson's points about just trying to see the positives as well. Um, you know, it, it, these changes, they come from a good place. Officers want what's best, just as we do as elected members for Dumfries and Galloway. It's good to see the positives and the negatives. Um, I do understand and sympathise with a lot of the concerns which have been raised in terms of deferring the report, just so we can fine tune it and get that extra information. Um, we've had a lot of good questions, so I'll just give you some easy questions now. <laughs> um, page 57, it's got a model of the timetable. Um, just little technicalities, and you might have already spotted this. Um, the brunch period on Fridays, it says from 11.20 to 11.50, which um, I'm not that great at maths, but I think that's half an hour. But it says 40 minutes, so I'm just I'm assuming that's a typo. We can get some clarity on that. Um, thank you. And in terms of the periods, um, when I was at school, we had registration periods first thing in the morning. Um, is that accounted for within these time slots and such? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Again, if I go back to the, the working group that's made up of, of schools, there is um, always debate around personal social education time or registration time throughout throughout the schools. Everybody wants something a little bit different. So again, they have collectively agreed that they would not have the, the registration period. However, PSC would still be delivered within the curriculum, so there's still be that offer. Thank you. Does that help? Um, can we bring in Elizabeth from the Youth Council, please? Um, so, following up what Val said, um, the, generally the main reason to support the um, change for the four and a half um, day week was that the current schedule is tiring for students and um, the four and a half days would improve well-being balance and productivity for people studying as it's the same time just use smarter um, and the main reason to not support it was that longer days could make it harder to focus for students and um, it's disruptive to students who need routine and could be an issue for families for childcare, especially young people who can't be on their own at home thank you elizabeth allison Thank you, Elizabeth. I've, I've captured the points you've made there, and I'll certainly put those into uh, the work we, we are going to do moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Councillor Young. 
Hey, thank you. It's been a very interesting discussion, which I've followed carefully as an ex-teacher. Um, the point I'm going to make is quite a simple one. We're looking at two different things here. One is the alignment of the timetables. The other is a move from a five-day to four-and-a-half-day school week. And I'm just wondering if they deserve separate papers. Should these two different things be combined as they are in today's paper, or if they're brought back, if they're deferred and brought back, which I expect will happen, then perhaps they should come back as two different papers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Jim, would you like to take that? Happy to take it. My my understanding is that the the way that we go about um, aligning or not is is actually a matter that schools can just do. We already have a partially aligned timetable. So I, I, whilst I, I entirely accept the correct point you made that there are two things on the table, I believe Councillor McGregor started the conversation with exactly that point. Um, uh, I, I don't think there's two papers needed here because. Um, the crux of all of this is about the four and a half day week. That's what the consultation will need to determine. I think equally as Councillor Hill mentioned, we can have alignment without four and a half days. That, that's, and the alignment has to happen for reasons of efficiency, for reasons of uh, broadening the, the curriculum offer and so on and so forth. And I think that is something that's determined. I think what isn't determined, uh, as has been made very clear by yourselves, thank you to me today, is that we need to have a much wider and, and deeper conversation about the merits and demerits of going to a four and a half day week. And that's absolutely what I'm committing to you, that I will bring the consultation mandate in May and you can have a look at that and then we'll we'll get the outcomes and that for you for a, a, a paper but I can't tell you exactly when that'll be because May is very clo close on the summer holiday which will mean that we've got limited ability to get young people's views on that one. hope that clears that one up, Councillor Young. Thank you. Julie, would you like? Thank you. Um, I was just coming back in with a couple of questions that were, nobody else has um, overtaken there. Um, Regarding the change of lunchtime, and if we're considering that earlier break, that brunch break on a Friday, there's a bit of a well-being issue there for staff and young people as well. So anybody who has timed medication linked to food, so diabetics, for example. So we need to be very conscious of that if we are moving breaks around. For someone who injects with insulin, it tends to be timed and at specific times and they need to eat at specific times. Lots of parents have aligned their meal times at home to accommodate when school meal times normally run. So it's something that would need to be considered. So it was just to bring it up um, for your consideration and also for staff, because we do have some staff who are also um, need their medication at set times. And at the moment, they're able to do that because they've got that routine set up. So it's just something for consideration there. I had a question about page 32, 6.1, and it was to do with the efficiency saving that you've just mentioned, Jim. And it said, um, let me get the right bit of the paper. It said about time lost through an inefficient timetables equates to 7.3 full-time equivalent across all secondaries. You've said the figure may be slightly lower as promoted staff have additional time for management, which equates to 5.8. So over the whole authority, is that in reality only a saving of 1.5 full-time equivalent? Sorry, I'm struggling with the buttons. Um, no, the savings averaged out across the whole authority at uh, that sort of 5.7 FTE. But it then says that the additional time for management is 5.8, and that needs to be taken into consideration, and it would lower the figure. Sorry, that's the reduction from 7.3 to 5.8. Ah, right. It's Thank you. Because we looked at it, and I was confused. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, Councillor Lowe. 
Thank you. Given the level of discussion that we are having, there are 22 other councillors who are currently not part of this conversation. I'm wondering if it's possible to have a member seminar to actually feed some of the background information, make it clear what teaching time, learning time, etc., is, because I'm sure we're not as well represented in some wards here who are, you know, may have specific issues they'd like to raise. So could we add that as a recommendation 2.3, please? I know the team would be absolutely delighted to do that because I think the comments here around this has come from a this has come from a good place, and we know that we need to talk to more people about it. But it is, it's a, it, we we need to make sure that people fully understand what we're recommending here and listen to the concerns that people have. So if we commit to bring back a consultation mandate to the May committee, but in addition to that, offer whether it be member seminars or community conversations, but to, to really talk to people about what we are aiming to do, to make the changes that we all want to make in order to meet the needs of children and families. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. It's just to provide a Labour Group perspective. We are not, not opposed to what's being discussed in the paper, and thank you for the paper, I um, commend it. And it's really difficult to write these things and it's really hard to pick them to bits, which is what was being done. So appreciate what you've done in the work, which actually promotes further discussion, which is really um, positive. Just to repeat what um, Councillor Scobie stated, it, you have mentioned catering staff, cleaning staff, transport staff, so it would be useful to consult with all unions. Um, but could they be added to the, the panel? I don't know if it's, if it's possible to have you know, the, the non-teaching unions added to the panel just to provide that completeness of... of, of um, and also, could we have the same parameters attached to the primary school consultation? You probably don't, don't even want to go there at the moment, but when that happens, they have the same parameters attached to that um, seminar, of, included in a seminar that, that Councillor Lowe very helpfully suggested, um, and also the, the same parameters in, the, in the, the working group, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jim? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jamieson? Uh, thank you again. Uh, I concur with both uh, Willie Sco Councillor Scobie and Councillor Dorwood. I think it's, it's very important that the, the unions are included. Um, I, I would support uh, Councillor Lowe on the, on the seminar. I'd also, I would also like to see when the consultation paper comes out. I know it's difficult to get a lot of information in a consultation paper because folk get fed up reading it, but I think it's really important that people understand what they're, they're discussing and what they're making comment on. There's been a lot of anecdotal stuff here that I can see. At, as I say, in my regular coffee shop, I've been chinned about kids getting an extra half day and I've had to explain to you there's no reduction in teaching time. It's because of equitable things and all the rest of it. We can't get into too much detail, but we'll have to try and get it across to people that this is us trying to transform the education system for the benefit of the children and the staff to get better outcomes for everybody. Notwithstanding the fact that we have to acknowledge the, the, the requirements of the community in terms of employers, etc. But it's been done in other regions and there's case studies in here. And we need to try and, rather than come in with preconceived ideas and you know, one shot at the, the story, we need to see the whole picture. And I'm coming from a position where I've, I've been on the workshops kindly when I was vice chairman and I've done a lot of work so I'm a wee bit biased towards asymmetric working week, but I've got to play devil's advocate with myself and say, well, what's wrong with them? What can we do better? So I would just encourage everybody not to, to come in with an open mind and, and their consultation preface, if it can, just briefly let people understand without any bias, this is what an asymmetric working week, this is what it effectively means to your children, what it may mean for you. So and I'm probably teaching my granny out with two eggs, but it's really important that folk, when you answer a consultation, you don't have the answer before you read the consultation. I don't like this, or I like this. So I think it needs to be really informed, knowledge-based, uh, and I'm sure you could, you're aware of that anyway. But uh, I support all the, the discussions that we've had today, and it's been really useful. And thanks to the chair for allowing the extensive discussion, because too often we're shut down uh, before we get into the real discussion. Uh, so I think, I think we've... I think we're at a place where we're all comfortable that it come, we come back uh, and, and we review it again. Thank you, Councillor Jamieson. I think we all agree with you on that. Julie, did you want to come back in? I just had one more thing. It was um, 
about an equality impact assessment? Will one of those be carried out? Yes, it will, is the, the short answer. And just to go back to your previous question about the diabetics, because I forgot to answer that, I'm just, apologies for that. We are working with schools, and of course, when young people's day changes, for example, if they have a school trip, of course, we work accordingly. So we would use the same rules in terms of making sure young people with diabetic, diabetes were, were looked at and cared for. In the same way, the young people with ADHD or any other young people uh, would be cared for. Thank you. Councillor Hill. Hi, thank you for letting me back in. Um, Sorry, I forgot to ask, I had asked in the um, committee on the 30th of November when we were shown these different models, if we could take back to the working group and it was agreed um, by yourself, Alison, that you would take it back about the uh, uh, set time um, being in the morning um, because of the benefits that it brought um, and the lack of disruption it would cause if, say, a child was late to school because the bus had broken down or, you know, a parent couldn't get them there. Having that time at the beginning in a tutor, form tutor class, that allows a teacher to get to know those children and it also then gets them to recognise if that child's coming in a bit disorientated, something's wrong, that teacher can then look at the health and wellbeing of that child and they can pass that information on to every teacher on that child's timetable so that they can keep an eye on that child over the day. Um, so I was looking for a response to what the working group had thought to that, if the timetables are to be aligned and having that really important set form tutor time, how, whatever you want to call it, at the beginning of the day so that we can keep an eye on pupils and we can build better relationships between pupils and that designated teacher. Now, I know we have pupil support teachers, but it's completely different to pupil support teacher looking after a whole host of children to having that one teacher where if you haven't had a chance to do your homework in the morning or you're struggling with something or there's been a bereavement or something's happened, you can go directly to that teacher first thing in the morning and that can be highlighted throughout your timetable so that other staff are aware. What was the outcome of that, please, Alison? Because I haven't heard anything back. So... Um... As part of the original recommendations, the timetable that we put forward was a recommendation. So uh, acknowledging what you said at the last committee, it was taken back to the asymmetric timetable working group, but the 16 secondary schools agreed um, through their representation that that was not something they wanted to take forward. Can I come back in and ask for the reasons why, please, when the benefits are so huge for children? Currently, not all schools have such time, and so therefore it was discussed at, at length, is my understanding, and so therefore there are other ways of having that one-to-one -one contact with young people, particularly with the targeted young people, and that can be done preschool or at the start of a first period lesson, and that there was not an agreement that there needs to be that 30-minute um, set time at the start of every, every school day to have that one-to-one -one contact. Schools were confident that they could deliver for young people without having that 30-minute period of time. Can I just then please ask for it to be noted that um, I'm disappointed um, in that outcome because um, on, on looking at young children, we don't just look at the ones that are targeted. We look at all young children and I feel that that would be valuable. But I take on board what they've said. They work with the children, um, but I am disappointed at that outcome. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Hill. That will be noted. Thank you. Now, it seems to be that there's a level of concern here and it's not being addressed, and we need to look for another way forward. So hopefully we'll get those seminars set up, and there'll be a further paper coming to the May meeting. Thank you. As there are no further comments or questions, we'll now go to the recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I've changed the from what we've heard today. I've amended the recommendation here. I'll just read it out. So members are agreeing to defer consideration for a consultation mandate to be brought back to the May committee for members' consideration before progressing, and for a member seminar to be arranged for all elected members to allow for a full explanation on the proposals. Members happy with that? Yeah. You're happy. Thank you. We'll now move to item six, which is the school session dates for 25 to 28, and the report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. And Kenny Poulin is here to assist members 
have any questions. I'm going to up, open up the meeting for questions or debate. Thank you. Councillor State. It's just a comment, and Kenny knows where I'm coming. Since the 1st of July, kids have to go back on the Monday. I've had parents with parent councils have nipped my ears as how has this came about? Because I know a lot of parents have booked their holidays for that weekend and have no intentions of sending their kids to school and they're frightened what's got to happen because to cancel holidays, it's got to cost them a fortune. And I think I've said to Kenny Alam, they could have took the kids back on the 8th of January and had that Monday as a free day. But Kenny's explained to me how they work the holiday system, but I don't think it's been a good idea having the schools going back Monday, 1st of July this year. Uh, you know, can back that day to get their hold. Yes, Kenny, would you like to answer that? Yeah, just to say that the LNCT group are very aware of that, and, and when we're planning holidays and things, we're, we're um, in fact, we, we moved one of the holidays in one of the recommendations, I think it was Appendix 3, to make sure that we weren't coming back on, I think it was Monday the 3rd of July or something like that, so we're taking that um, recommendation, yeah. That's fine, Kenny, thanks very much. Thank you. I'm Julie. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in light of if we are moving to this proposed, proposed asymmetric week at some point, have you made sure that we meet the minimum teaching hours having a half-day Friday for the three years proposed? I know next year doesn't affect, the first year wouldn't really be affected, but the second two years, um, by my calculations, were short of teaching hours. Uh, I think if, if that were to be taken, we would go back to that and look at those dates again to make sure. I know that across the week, the learning hours and the teaching hours are correct, but um, I think there would be a piece of work to do there. Um, but I'd defer to the director there as well on that one. Thank you, Julie. And clearly this was agreed with the LNCT. And so this is a courtesy paper that normally custom and practices that our session dates come to Education Learning Committee having already been agreed by the teaching trade unions. So certainly those points can be picked up uh, in, in future meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further comments or questions? If not, we'll move to recommendations. Recommendations one, note the session dates for the years 2025 to 28, that these conform to the national conditions of service for teachers and note the recommendations of the LNCT for the placement of the 40 days annual leave together with the balance of days within the school holiday period defined as school closure days for the years 2025 to 28. Do we note one and two? Okay. Thank you. We'll now move to item seven, which is the transformation update, partnerships and school management arrangements. Report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. And we have John Thin is here to assist if members have any questions. I will open up the meeting to member debate. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a request in relation to recommendation 2.2 um, in relation to enrolment or transfer um, in the Casphere catchment area. So I understand that an email was sent out on the 27th of December between Christmas and New Year to uh, families in the, the Casphere catchment area. Um, and uh, as stated in the report, there was one, one application submitted. So the recommendation is for the, the school to continue to be mothballed. Um, there was a, an email went out on the, the 5th of March, I believe, <coughs> to stakeholders to, to notify them of the outcome of that enrolment period between the 29th of January and the, the 2nd of February. Um, Following that point, I've been contacted by numerous parents um, uh, alarmed that they had missed the email on the, the 27th of December. Um, some acknowledged that they did actually receive the, the email. Um, and the request that, that they've all put forward to me is, can the, the enrolment period be reopened for a short period to allow them to either enrol or transfer um, 
uh, their children to Carsfair Primary School. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. John, would you like to take that? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, and I'm aware of the situation with um, a small number of the Carsfair a community that have actually written to me directly to ask those those very questions and we were able to demonstrate that we had sent over 12,000 emails to all of our uh, families uh, and potential families in Dumfries and Galloway um, were able to evidence in fact that those emails were delivered I think there was only one in, in the Kirsfair that, that was uh, undelivered um, and so therefore we were able to um, understand that there was only one that was looking to enrol at uh, Kirsfair and Primary School for the start of the new year the challenge was round about the deadlines and dates. Uh, clearly, the deadline for submissions of applications um, for enrolment is the 15th of March, uh, which is tomorrow. Um, and the committee uh, cycle, unfortunately, left us with a slight peril in terms of uh, information sharing and the, um, the time that the committee reports were actually prepared and made public. We had a staff absence, unfortunately, where we had hoped to um, contact the parent that was looking to transfer their, their young person into Kirsfairn um, prior to the committee papers being published. Unfortunately, that was, that was not possible due to the, the staff absence. We were able to follow that up as soon as the, the member of staff was, uh, had returned uh, to work. Uh, we were able to do that. In terms of uh, opening up the enrolment process again, um, that would not be a recommendation I would wish uh, to, to see supported because we are currently in the the midst of the staffing exercise and the enrolment um, process and, and ensuring we've got the, the classes and the teacher numbers in those places. Um, and as I said before, the 15th of March is the date and parents have had that opportunity since then to enrol their children. And uh, as far as I'm aware, and I don't have the level of detail on this, there still is only one uh, child that, that's looked to, to enrol at uh, Kirsfairn uh, for the start of next year. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you for letting me back in, Chair. Um, having read the, the emails from parents, um, I, I think there is, is possibility as, as much as six or seven uh, pupils of, of primary school age within the Carsfairn catchment area who who would want to uh, attend Carsfairn Primary School, appreciating, of course, that the school is currently in mothballing. Um, but I think, in fairness to the parents, uh, I think it's understandable uh, that um, they missed an email on the, the 27th of December, and I'm sure many members of this, this committee would have missed emails that have come out from the, the, the council during that particular period. Um, what I would like to do is put forward a, a recommendation to change, uh, recommendation 2.2, and I have a form of words, if that would be okay to read them out. Inter and Tim, John, Tim, yeah. Do we want to make it? Okay, so I'll read out the the yes, the, 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 the replacement uh, that I'll take forward as a, a motion if required. Agree to provide a further opportunity for children of primary school age and residing in the Carsfairn Primary School catchment area to be enrolled or transferred to Carsfairn Primary School and for a report on the outcome to be brought back to this committee in due course. I, I, I'm not specifying um, particular dates between which it should be reopened. I would leave that to, to officers, um, but I, I, th I think it is only fair to the parents that they do get a, a short time span to enable them to, to enrol or apply to transfer. Thank you, Councillor Campbell, director. Do you Thank you. Uh, while the deadline is close, it is tomorrow, I haven't, I'm not aware that we have had any further requests. So I'm questioning whether we take a recommendation today, given the fact that the deadline hasn't actually passed. And if, if any parent wished to, they could phone this afternoon and we would certainly take that forward. So if there are five or six parents that you are aware of that are looking to transfer their children, could we recommend that we could have the, we could contact them at proactively this afternoon and have those requests recorded formally before the closing date of tomorrow, if that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I understand the, the, the difficulty, but um, I, I think for, I mean, I certainly I've got a, a, a working group after this committee, so I won't have time 
to to contact the the, the, the various parents that have contacted me. Um, but I think uh, you know I, I realise that the, the deadline passes tomorrow. Um, but I think there's a, a genuine reason for the, the parents missing the the, the period um, to to do so. So what I would ask is that they get the opportunity by the close of play tomorrow um, to allow them to do that. And I'm happy to contact them this evening to and request that. Yes. Yeah, you want to go. Um, I just wanted to add that if families do want to come forward and um, enrol or transfer, we would need them to complete the relevant paperwork in order to process that. But we, of course, would be supportive and make sure that that was expedited in a supportive manner. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just to confirm in terms of the paperwork, that's available on the Council website, I believe, is it? The enrolment forms uh, are available on the Council website. The transfer forms are available from the uh, local schools. So for the Kirsfairn children, it would be Dilry uh, Primary School. OK, uh, thanks for that. Thanks for the accommodation. Do you still want your recommendation to go forward? Yes, please. But we can maybe specify by close of play tomorrow. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, it was just with the regards to Beatup Primary, I just want to double check that the, the repairs will be completed before the next academic session. And I know there was some concerns raised by, by parents, as John's well aware. Um, but I believe that the parents are now happy with the new management and partnership arrangements. And I think you'd agree, John, is that correct? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I am assured by our uh, property estates and programmes uh, direct um, service that the repairs will be uh, ready and, and uh, in place by the start of the new academic session. Um, and I also know that we have engaged with the, the parent body and the community councils and uh, ward members regarding the, the revised management arrangements. And we have an open uh, afternoon planned, I think in April, late April, uh, in the Beatick Village Hall to assure anybody with any questions, we can answer those at, at that event. So thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, um, Councillor Wilson? Yes, thank you. Good, thank you. Councillor Scobie. I thought you'd forgotten my name again there. <laughs> I'm looking at page 69 of the report particularly. Uh, could I maybe say, to begin with, uh, if uh, Nugget's uh, recommendation to amend the, the recommendations is accepted. If it's not, then I'm quite happy to second the motion formally, if that is the case. But turning to St Ninian's uh, primary, I noticed there, there were no enrolments uh, or transfers received for a academic session 24-25. Uh, and then it goes on to say uh, those families who submit enrolments or transfer forms have been uh, contacted to discuss the options. Uh, maybe it's just me, but there seems to be some confusion there, you know. And again, uh, when I look at the following sentence, the delineated catchment area for St. James Primary School will continue to be temporarily realigned. My understanding is if any Roman Catholic child wishes, uh, then the nearest Roman Catholic school would be St. Joseph's and, and not necessarily on a temporary basis, and I've asked this question in the past. So two questions, just to clarify so that it's clear that there were no children uh, 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 and were the parents made aware that they could enrol at St Joseph's uh, and also that we can't keep it as a temporary, it must be a permanent for any Roman because the catchment area would then uh, enlarge rather than this idea that it's only a temporary basis. So just so that parents with Roman Catholic children know that the, the nearest one, and then it's for us to transport those children to the nearest Roman Catholic school. Yes, you're right. Um, I 
picked the error up myself, councillor school, you're yeah, correct. There was no children that enrolled or transferred. Um, it's simply been a typo as that second sentence. So my apologies. With regard to the temporary alignment statement, it has to be um, temporarily aligned because we've not gone through the form formal statutory consultation process on of closure. That, that applies to all unmothable schools. Yes, children of Roman Catholic faith enrolled or, or that live within St Ninian's catchment would be entitled to transport to St. Joe's, but there the is a temporary, temporary realignment because it's not officially closed. So if I'm hearing correctly, that will be removed, then it will be a permanent catchment area uh, once the, the process has gone through. And just to clarify, were the parents made aware uh, that, that they could transfer to St. Joseph's uh, at the time of enrolment? So, yes, all families were made aware. John and myself met with um, the remaining families um, when, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, the role um, was very low, but we met with those families at the school and we discussed all the options available and they all made very different choices as to where their children went. Ultimately, there weren't any families that chose to go to uh, St. Joseph's, but it was an option made available to them. Thank you. Councillor Jamieson. Yeah, thank you. I've got one uh, specific question and a more general question. I'll start with a specific one, and that's on page 67, uh, item 2.5, regarding Betuk Primary School. Uh, I know there was there was some happiness in the process this going through. I, I've just wondered if if we're confident that all people were engaged properly and, and that the process has settled down now and the folk, the parents are happy. Yeah, I think Councillor uh, Wilson's question was in relation to that as well, yeah. Councillor Jimison. So yeah, we're, we're as confident as we can be. You know, people don't particularly like change at times, but yeah. uh, we're confident we've got the right arrangements in place okay. and we're moving forward on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my other query is more, more general. You know, the, the mothballing and the statutory process, I, I wonder if it would be helpful if certainly the members were given an update on what mothballing is, why it's introduced, and when we move on from that to the statutory consultation, um, it would be it would be good to be confident that we understand the process and the need for it, uh, or otherwise, if that could be done. I know it'll be somewhere in the depth of, but if, if that, if, even if the links are sent to us, is that we we can. There's obviously. You know, people get upset when these things are put in place in the last councillor. So it would be really good if we had that, that, that evidence, that sort of evidence, that information that, that, that so we can be as informative with them as we possibly can. Thank you, Councillor Jemison, and I'm aware that this has been the subject of some scrutiny in the recent weeks. Members have agreed the primary school mothballing policy and the arrangements for pre-consultation and that's been really helpful in allowing officers to move ahead and having conversations with communities and of course the Scottish Government have guidance on mothballing all schools so we are looking to how what else we need to do to ensure that our mothballing arrangements and pre-consultation discussions meet everyone's expectations so everyone is clear be it primary schools and secondary schools as we move ahead with the school estate principles you can certainly see in some of these papers around the the, the principles of the school estate um, future that members have also agreed so that this work is taken together in tandem but key to us is that we are we are looking to make sure everybody is clear as to what questions we're asking and when we ask them. So we will look to bring an enhanced paper to a future committee. Sorry, thank you. And, and, and John will roll his eyes at this, but again, we need clarity. When we have a, a partnership arrangement, there's 10 principles that we go through to identify. It's just to make sure when we engage in discussions with partnerships that, that the parents are well aware that these principles are, guide, are, are guidance, they're not statutory. I know John's confirmed that in the past, but if there is discussions on partnership, just, just to ensure that the, the people that are involved, the stakeholders, understand that, that some of these principles, they'll have to add up or, you know, there's, there's, they're not cut and dried is what I'm trying to say. So is that, you know, the, the BTUC uh, 
situation kind of brought that up because some folk thought, you know, we could have three schools in a partnership, which they can, but it's not, it's against the principles. So it's just to, to be able to make sure that the stakeholders are fully informed uh, and they don't go running off with the wrong ideas and asking for things that are not possible and vice versa. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. Councillor Davis. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, my question has actually been answered by John. It was just basically in relation to the BTIC Primary School and Johnson Bridge Primary School. It was obviously I've had contact from parents um, with concerns, you know, and fears that the school won't reopen um, for the next academic year. And it was just basically an update on how the repairs are going. Uh, but I'm quite pleased with the answer that um, John has given to, um, to Councillor Wilson. So that really answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Hill. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Scobie raised the point I was going to raise about St Ninian's um, and St Joseph's. But just on another point of that, following on from the last committee on the 25th of January, where we looked at agenda item number 10 and we were considering the consultation for children who are neurodiverse. Looking at St Ninian's School, I do understand and appreciate that it's in math ball status at the moment, but the primary school that is in the same grounds, Penningham Primary School, have a prefabricated building at the moment for the learning support base. And I'm just wondering if the, you know, the school have been contacted, if they would be um, wanting to use that building um, to provide more support um, and to actually have you know, rather than a prefabricated building, a proper building with different rooms in because they have the staff there and it might be a better space. So would that be a possibility in an interim basis um, rather than that school just being closed and, you know, no electric, nothing being used and the prefabricated building not being used in this case? Have, have we approached the school? Is that a suggestion that we could look at um, whilst we're on the school estate and we're talking about this school, please? Thank you, Councillor Hill. Yes. Uh, thank you for that question, Councillor Hill. And I think that absolutely your, your last point that you made in terms of that wider review of our school estate is, is entirely what we're trying to do. And in, in the paper that Larn Forrest described earlier on in the meeting um, is what we'll be bringing to committee in, in May. And it's about the utilisation of our, our assets, make sure that we're using our assets as, as well as we possibly can, maximising the use of those assets um, and, and trying to ensure that we're you know, we're not asking for additional funding or resources when we've got we've got those resources. Some of that will require repurposing. We know that you know the demand for early learning and childcare continues to, to evolve, um, and it picks up on the points regarding you know the the, the change in demographics across our our, um, our, our council, our, our region, um, and trying to make sure that we've got that plan moving forward that we can we can do that. I think the only risk at the moment is that uh, clearly we need to be very aware of the fact that. It, um, we have not permission to close St Ninian's Roman Catholic School in Newton Stewart. Um, we will be bringing a further paper back um, to this committee to, to um, seek um, views on whether that is the process we should be undertaking. And the paper that follows this paper um, does actually look specifically at one school and, and, and hopefully gives members a reassurance of the process that we will go through to make sure that we do that properly and with full member agreement uh, to understand what that longer term future for the school could look like. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can I come back in, Chair? Councillor Lowe. Sorry, Councillor Hill, did you want to come back in again? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry. It's it's really encouraging to hear that we're going to have it back at the May committee. And I, like I say, I do understand and appreciate that the school isn't closed. Um, but whilst we don't have anybody on the roll and we're looking at, you know, at the moment, nobody's applied for it. Could that building be utilised in an interim basis? That's what I was asking. Could we look at that rather than a prefabricated building? Because we do have a lot of children, um, you know, accessing that prefab building and we have an empty building at the moment that isn't being utilised. So that was sort of like whether the school had been contacted to ask whether that, you know, they would like that um, and whether that would be a possibility rather than it just being at the moment not officially closed, but doors closed and the resources in there and the facilities is in there um, possibly being utilised, like I say, rather than the prefab. It was just a question and just a suggestion to see if that could be a possibility and if, you know, the school had been asked about that. 
No, in answer, the school hasn't been asked about it, and I think it's our nervousness around about the presumption of closure, which sits within the Act, that we need to be very aware of the fact that anything that we are proactively seen to do to repurpose a school before, if you like, it's declared not required, then potentially has that, that impact. But um, your comments are, are, are very valid, very well made, um, and we will continue to look at the options for our school estate to see what we can use it for if we have got other um, pressing matters or pressing, pressing priorities that we need to consider. So thank you for your comments. Does that answer your question for the moment, Councillor Hill? Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lowe. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to slightly step out my own ward area here. Um, we've had an example recently of a school that was multiple, but actually the community have needed to use it because it was their only building, and that's in I Primary. Um, so is that consideration part of the standard consultation when we multiple the school? Should that, you know, if that was being used by the, the community, it should, should not have been closed up and then had to be reopened? And my other question is, just bearing in mind that we're going to be mothballing a school in our own ward, is how those that are empty are looked after and the maintenance. We have uh, the school building that's going in our ward is, is in excellent condition, and we'd really like to keep it that way. I mean, it's literally, had a, you know, it's been well cared for by the community. So, you know, what is the maintenance regime for these schools that are left empty? Thank you. Yeah. So um, with regard to A Primary School, that was, um, I'm going to describe it as a unique situation. There's no other council um, facility or community facility in that, in that area. The community were already um, using one classroom of the school. It was, um, it had been refurbished in such a manner that that room could be accessed admittedly whilst the school was operational. And that's what became um, unique about it in that we could no longer meet all our requirements from um, a building perspective <laughs> that where the community were coming in they couldn't then access fire panels and things like that to turn off alarms and that's when um, it became a little bit tricky for it to operate under that that manner so um, I, as we know the agreement was given not on this committee but um, to allow the community to use that but on the pretense that if the school um, was then to reopen, um, it would revert back to previous operational procedures for that community group. Um, I think that's where it becomes slightly different for St Ninians. I would hate to, um, firstly, as John said, the presumption of closure and repurpose it, but then potentially take that um, away in totality. You know, if we were to repurpose that for um, for the learning centre, for example, to then remove that from use if there was the demand for it. So we just need to be careful around those other arrangements. Um, with regard to what happens to our buildings once they are mothballed, they are maintained on a wind and water type basis, um, which for the bulk of schools, absolutely, that, that's, that's not a problem. Some um, are boarded up, and that is for their protection and um, also a requirement of our insurers. Now, that's not... Um, across the piece that that happens, it depends on where the school is sited. Um, you know, if there's sections of it that are that can't be seen, that that makes sense to to, to board those up. We try not to. Um, we also have Clarker Works with sets of keys that go in and um, check on the building. We also, at the request of our insurers, um, remove um, large volumes of paper, th things that put the building at risk, um, IT equipment. So there's a, there's a number of things that happen. Um, but once again, back to a previous statement around presumption of closure, we try not to strip it of all its, its assets, uh, oh, its resources, sorry, if we can help it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lowe. Do we have any further comments or questions that anyone would like to bring forward? I don't seem to. We'll now go to the recommendations. I'll bring Tracy in to go over Council Campbell's, Campbell's recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I've, I've wrote down a form of words here. I'd just like Councillor Campbell to confirm if he's happy with that. Um, so I've, instead of 2.2, .2, to agree to provide a further opportunity for children of primary school age residing in Cash Fairn area to make an application prior to the closing date of the 15th of March. And if this results in any changes to the status for 2024-25, then an update will be brought back to members. Yeah, I would agree to that, but I think it would also be helpful if I, or as committee, could have a, an update on how many pupils have 
being enrolled or transferred, if that can be. I'm happy to accept that, you know, off table. If that, we, we, by close of play tomorrow, we can then confirm with members by email, if that was suitable, how many had actually made that request. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Thank you. I will now continue with the recommendations. Um, we have one is note the A primary school will remain in mothball status for the session 24 to 25 due to no children attending the school as detailed in paragraph 4.3 and that officers will engage with local families and the wider community of A primary school for further cons to further consider op future options for the school. Three, note that St Ninian's Roman Catholic primary school will remain in mothball status for session 24 to 25, due to no children attending the school, as detailed in paragraph 4.5, and that officers will engage with local families and the wider community of St Ninian's Primary School to further consider future options for the school. Four, yes, Councillor Scobie. Just, just on that point, if we could build in that the, the catchment area, it's been looked at to be ex, uh, expanded so parents do know that is the case, that if they are Roman Catholic, they can put their children, uh, they can accommodate the children at St Joseph's. All right. The catchment area to be expanded. John, perhaps John can help. Sorry? Perhaps John can yeah, it's just to say, Chair and, and Councillor Scobie, that it is actually referred to in uh, 4.5 within the, the body of the report, the point that you've just made. Yeah, and I made the point, and, you know, I commented on that, uh, but uh, as we said, it's done here as a temporally uh, uh, alignment, and that's to allow process. It's so that that is total uh, clarity in that, that that catchment area, once the process is by, will expand to include uh, catchment area of St Joseph's. And I think the point that John's making, that we're, we're very careful on any presumption of closure. So certainly, should we take bring a future paper on the future of the school, that will be made very clear as part of the statutory consultation. But we wouldn't want to fall foul of any statutory guidance at this stage, because the school, ha we have not got to that stage. But certainly, in any discussion with parents, we will make absolutely clear that uh, that is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. Four is note that Thundergarth Primary School will remain in mothball status for session 24 to 25 due to no children attending the school as detailed in paragraph 4.6 and that officers will engage with local families and the wider community of Thundergarth Primary School to further consider future options for the school. And five, Note the plan change in management arrangements for Betuk Primary School and Johnston Bridge Primary School from August 2024 in accordance with the strategic framework as agreed by members on the 13th of March 2021 to coincide with the planned reopening of Betuk Primary School as detailed in fact paragraphs 4.7. Do we note 1, 3, 4 and 5 and the recommended changes to 2? Thank you. We'll now move to item 8, which is the statutory consultation plan for Hutton Primary School, and this report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning, and John Thin is here to assist if members have any questions. I will open up the meeting to members' debate. Thank you. Counsel Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Can I see? Um, I attended all the public meetings regarding um, Hutton Primary School, and I'd just like to thank John and Louise and the other officers for, for arranging these and listening and addressing the concerns that were raised um, at these meetings. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, transport for the children who are attending Apple. Garth now, um, I think I'm right in saying they're entitled to school transport, but I've had a couple of families contact me saying they're having issues getting school transport. 
And I'm just wondering what will happen with the catchment area now for Applegarth. Will it include the Hutton catchment area? Because that's quite a vast area. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for your comments. And there have been well attended meetings, and you know, there's been good discussion at the meetings, and, and, and obviously trying to support people through decisions moving forward. And, and um, the, the sort of two issues regarding the transport arrangements are that at the current time, we've temporarily, again, it goes back to the previous language we've used, tempor temporarily realigned uh, the catchment to Applegarth because it had the shared management arrangements prior to that. Um, and we understand there have been some challenges with regards to the availability of transport. And uh, I know that the transport, the school transport team have provided uh, financial payments to those uh, where we weren't able to get a, a taxi or a minibus. Um, in terms of the realignment of the catchment area, that's what the purpose of the, the consultation will be. And it, you're absolutely right, it is a very large catchment area now because it obviously picks up on the old Estale Muir. Uh, where we had a school at Estiel Muir and, and others uh, previous to that. So there is, through that consultation process next year, we will be very much, on the assumption that members uh, accept the recommendations, we will be very much looking at that in its entirety to make those decisions with the communities about what is the best um, way that we provide that um, or divide up that catchment to make sure that the, we don't uh, negatively impact on families who are living within that area um, as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to come back in, Councillor Wilson? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any further comments or questions? We don't seem to have any more. I will now move to recommendations. Note the community engagement undertaken as detailed in paragraphs 4.2, 4.3, 4.4 .4 and 4.6. Two, note the outcome of academic session 24 to 25, the new enrolment and pupil transfer, as detailed in paragraphs 4.5, and three, agree to the commencement of the statutory consultation process for the closure of Hutton Primary School in accordance with the Schools Consultation Scotland Act 2010, as detailed in paragraphs 4.7. Do we note one and two and agree with three? We do agree. Thank you. Now, I have, is there any other business? But I have not, had not been notified by any urgent business. It means the meeting will now close. Thank you all for your contributions and your attendance. <laughs>